Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to day four of the Go Cloud Architects free AWS Advanced Networking course. And this is a free AWS full course, and this is some AWS networking training. And I'm excited to be here with you for our fourth day. As a reminder, we've been here for approximately four days. We've been having a lot of fun. We've been working on cloud networking. For those of you that don't know me, although most of you have been here all week, my name is Michael Gibbs. I'm the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Architects, and we're an organization that's really dedicated towards building high-performance cloud computing and networking careers. Now, I've been working in this tech industry for over 25 years. I've been helping others get their first tech job or get promoted in tech now for more than two decades, and it's really, really fun. Now, when we're talking about tech, you know, there's all kinds of tech and it's all exciting to me because tech can transform businesses. Tech can enable communications. Tech can enable collaboration. Tech can make such a difference in all of our lives. And that's why I've been in this tech world for decades. And I love every last minute of it. Absolutely. But when we're talking about tech, it all has a foundation. And the foundation for everything that we do in tech is the network. If the network isn't built right, nothing will work. If the network isn't built right, it'll be too slow. If the network isn't built right, we will have a tremendous amount of problems. That's why I'm always excited to talk about networking. So in our AWS Advanced Networking course, we're going to talk about some networking. As you recall yesterday, we talked about and ended on some network performance optimizations. We started talking about things like cluster placement groups and spread placement groups and partition placement groups. We talked a lot about jitter and delay and, and all kinds of things going on. Today, we're going to talk a little bit more about some network performance tuning optimizations. And the good news is we should have a, a fair amount of time today to be able to answer a lot of questions if you guys have them, work through some architectural situations or case studies if you desire towards the end. So we have a fair amount of time left over today. So I want to make this the best experience for you. So if you're here and you're ready to get started, type hashtag cloud hired and I'll know you're ready to get hired. Hit the like button. And if you've got some friends that you think would benefit from this, please spread the word, invite them. The more the merrier. We'd love to help as many people as we possibly can. So welcome everyone. Let's get cloud hired. So, wonderful. Now I know who's here. I like to see who's here. Make sure everybody's paying attention. You know, and if we do, when we do these things via Zoom, you know, we get to talk and here, I can only know that you're here by messages in there and I wanna know we're helping you all. So cloud hired, fantastic everyone. Makes me proud, makes me happy to know that we're all here participating on a single mission to help all of you guys get cloud hired. Otherwise, what's the point of training? It's to make you better at your job or get you the job in the first place. Certifications are great. The whole point is getting cloud hired though. So. Let's use what we can as tools, and then let's do what we really can to go out there and get cloud hired. So without further ado, let's talk about tuning some network performance in the AWS environment. So when you're dealing with servers and you're dealing with networking, the faster access we get to the network, the better. So we want everything fast. Now, yesterday in the evening, I did a virtualization demo. And when I did a virtualization demo, you know, when we built these machines, we dealt with virtual network cards, virtual, virtual graphics cards, virtual hard drives, virtual everything. Virtual, meaning logical, not physical. Now, when you're dealing with technology, when you're dealing with a video card or a GPU, on that GPU itself, You've got physical devices. If it's NVIDIA, you've got CUDA cores, for example. And those CUDA cores are doing the computing. It is physical hardware that's designed to do a physical task, and it does it real well. Now, when we're dealing with the cloud or we're dealing with virtualization, we use fake network cards and fake GPUs. They're logical. Now, these fake GPUs and these fake network cards don't perform at the speed of a real network card. How could they? It's software versus hardware. So when we need hardware performance, the only way around it is to get hardware performance. So prior to talking about network performance virtualization, because I want to make it really clear, 
If any of you have ever worked with the technology PCI pass-through, that's what we're going to be talking about. So what is PCI pass-through? So if we were going to take a virtual machine like the con I showed you yesterday, and we wanted the virtual machine to have access to a physical card, we could push that physical card into the virtual machine, and that's called PCI pass-through. So when you're on AWS and you need a GPU optimized instance to do some machine learning, what they're doing on these servers is they're pushing through that GPU into the virtual machine. And it's called PCI pass-through. So now we're going to take that same logic and we're going to apply that same logic, that same technology. And apologies, I live in Florida and there is always, always, always landscapers around everywhere. So hopefully it's not coming across too loud in the background. When we're now, let's talk about optimizing the network performance and optimizing the network card. So, when we're dealing with virtual machines, we're typically dealing with a virtual network card. Virtual network card, not physical hardware. Software is always slower than hardware. So, what if we wanted to push a physical network card into the virtual machine? Now, we can, and that's what AWS calls enhanced networking. Enhanced networking is quite simply when you push an actual physical network card into the virtual machine. Now, when you're dealing with this, you're dealing with the technical term single root IO virtualization. I didn't make up that VMware term single root IO virtualization. I like the term PCI pass through. Why? I'm putting a PCI card into a virtual machine. I know what it is and it makes it so PCI pass through push a network card into the virtual machine, and now you're dealing with high power, high performance. So this is what we're talking about. Now, that will give you better, faster networking than you would traditional get. So if you need it, it's AWS Enhanced Networking. Now, there's another networking option, which is software, but it's a specialty driver that AWS just came up with, and they call it a virtual fabric adapter. Now, this virtual fabric adapter is pretty interesting. It's a specialty driver adapter, and it can offer some relatively high performance. You know, it's been designed to go up to 400 gigabits per second, but, you know, no, but the speeds that are offered currently are nowhere through that. But the point is, is, you know, AWS is working on this network performance thing. Because they know the limitations with software-based devices, they use the support, you know, PCI pass-through, otherwise known as single root IO virtualization or enhanced networking. They also support the enhanced fabric adapter, which is a high-speed, high-performance driver, a software driver, but one that can deliver much better performance over the standard elastic network interface. So let's talk a little about monitoring your systems. So you've got to know what goes on the network. And the reality is, your applications are simple. If it's a user sitting on their phone and they're playing with their phone, it either works or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, it's easy to identify. But the network is hidden. The network is the plumbing. So you've got to monitor the network because it's not going to be obvious so quickly. And when the network goes down, it's not like your application goes down where you know exactly what the problem is. When it goes down, you got to figure it out. Is it an application? Is it a server? Is it a firewall causing the problem? Is it an access list? Do you not have a route on the routing table? <laughs> Are messages getting in but being blocked? So you see there's a lot of stuff that we got to look into, especially when we're dealing with technology, especially when we're dealing with the network because the network is hidden from the average user. So because the plumbing is hidden in many cases, we've got to be really careful with regards to what we're doing. So we can use CloudWatch. And when we use CloudWatch, you know, which is the standard AWS logging, we get a lot of things that we can actually do. So, for example, we can monitor our VPNs or our direct connections with CloudWatch. We can see how much traffic is being sent. We can see if our connections are up, meaning passing traffic, or down, meaning they're down. So we can figure that out. We can set up like an SNS alert, like a simple notification alert, like a text message that says, text Mike, if the network's down. CloudWatch will also help us collect VPC flow logs, which for those of us network people out there, those of us that would have worked with Cisco and NetFlow, <laughs> it'll give you really, really, really good information. It almost gives you 
limited packet sniffer protocol analyzer kind of kind of benefits. Cisco Wireshark is a great free protocol analyzer you can use to look at your traffic on the network. But realistically speaking, we're actually talking about here, um, you know, right now. So that's what we're kind of talking about. Now, with regards to network troubleshooting, no matter how good your designs are, things are going to break. They're going to break. And even when you have the most simple, elegant solution, just a direct connection, which is the easiest thing in the world, you're still going to have problems. You're going to have problems with your router, problems with your router at the direct connection location, problems with the fiber that's under the ground. It's going to happen. There'll be a switch port that'll break on the service provider switch. There'll be a problem across the AWS backbone, whether it be an L2 problem, whether it be an L3 or routing problem, the problems are going to be there. So it's not that we're going to ever be in a position to design around failures where no failures occur. But what's going to actually happen is as follows. You'll be able to fix them when they occur. So let's talk about how to troubleshoot. And I'm going to give you my methodology. There's a lot of methodologies, but I've been in the networking world for a long time. Generally speaking, unless you're looking at like a solar winds or you're looking at some form of network monitoring platform, you're not going to know. You're going to get a phone call. Somebody's going to call you up and say, I can't get to this server. So that's typically speaking the first thing. Now, as architects, we don't usually troubleshoot. But you have to know how. And as architects, it's very common that the tier one, the tier two, and the tier three of the technical support, the TAC, the help desk, can't solve it. It's also common that after they can't solve it, it'll go to some of the cloud engineers. And sometimes, while the cloud engineers are much more technical than we cloud architects for building things, sometimes these things end up being big picture problems there. It's going to need someone that can take a step back, that can troubleshoot. And that often becomes the actual architect you're involved in the troubleshooting. Now, either you're involved in the troubleshooting because you're buying lunch for the customer and you're smoothing things over. You could be involved in the troubleshooting because you're taking care of your cloud engineering team. Or you could be involved in the troubleshooting because the help desk or the technical support center didn't make it. The engineers didn't make it. And now this customer is critical. They're upset. And you, the architect, are going to have to get in there and, and, and troubleshoot as part of the team. So... Let's talk about it. When that first phone call comes in and says, the server is not reachable, what do you do? The first thing you should do, assuming to try and connect to the server officially, is to ping the server, to send an ICMP echo message to the server. If it comes back, you know. Now, personally, I start with the IP address of the server not the DNS name. I always start with the server's IP address. Here's the thing. If I can ping the server by its IP address, and then I, can, I try and ping it with its DNS name, and it doesn't go through, but I can reach it via its IP address, and I can't ve reach it through its DNS name, can anybody right now tell me what the problem is? Tell me in the chat box. If I can reach it with a ping, but I can't reach it with a DNS name, could somebody tell me what the problem is? most likely. If not, I'll tell you, but I just want to see if it's obvious to you guys and why I always start with an IP address as opposed to a DNS name. David Page, yes. If I can reach it by the IP address, but I can't miss it, but I can't reach it via the DNS name, chances are I have a DNS problem. So start with the name and then if that works, great. And if it doesn't work, go to DNS. So I start with the name. If I got a reply, we know there's a problem with the DNS. Start doing DNS troubleshooting. If we don't get a response to the, uh, the ping with the IP address, there's no point in trying to do it via the DNS because, you know, it's not going to work if you can't reach this IP address. So now, if you go to ping that server and you don't get a response, guess where do you go next? What do you do? So... The next thing that you should do is try to ping that server's gateway IP address. So the gateway, the router between the server and 
and uh, the, the server that's not reachable. It, now, everybody, if you can reach the router or the gateway where the device is, it means your network is good to the gateway or the router at the remote location. Okay, so let's look at it this way. You've got a server. It's, either, it's in your data center. If your server is in your data center, the server has a default gateway. The server's default gateway points to a router that gets the server off of the subnet. If you can reach the default gateway, but you can't reach the server, you know the problem exists between the gateway and the server. So then, if you can reach the if you can reach the gateway, and you can't reach this server, can you reach any other servers on that same subnet? And I'm wondering if whiteboarding this is going to make it better or make it worse. So I'm looking at your question there, Nitropan. I don't know if it's going to make it better or make it worse. We could try whiteboarding it out and see what happens. Okay, let's try that nitro pen. So let's do this and go over here. So let's try a different approach. So let's look at it this way. If you, so let's say you're here, you're here in your data center or your, your on-premise environment. Say over here, you've got your cloud. Let's do this. Let's make sure there's no fill. Let's take our, our let's take our gateway. Or let's take our every VPC as we went to has a virtual router, which is where which is what does the routing. So let's say this is the gateway. Gateway just means router. Let's say this server. this server and this server I've had one more servers and this server let's create our direct connections between here and our AWS environment okay so now this is what our connections look like and of course somewhere along the line is so let's try this so now if you're here and you get a phone call that says i can't reach the server what you should do is send an icmp echo which is a ping directly to the server and if the server is awake alert and alive guess what you'll get an icmp echo reply that'll say i'm here everyone i'm here everyone i'm here everyone so what should you do next? You ping this server. And if you can't reach this server, well, you don't know what the problem is. Is the server dead? Is the network bad? Do we have a problem? So now the server, in order to reach all these servers, in order to get off of their local subnet or reach you, they have to go through a router, this gateway or the router that all these servers have has the routes in it that knows to go this way towards the on-premise environment for the traffic. So if you try and send a message to the server and the server doesn't re respond, you don't know what happened. So the next thing that you would do in your troubleshooting is you're gonna send a ping or an ICMP echo to the gateway because the gateway is the next hop to reaching you. You leave your environment, you go through your direct connections, you hit the gateway, and then you go to the server. So you're going to ping the gateway, the router that the server uses to communicate back with you. Now, guess what? If you can reach this gateway, it means that you have a good network connection to the gateway. 
So if you can ping the gateway, but not the server, you know you have one of three problems. You have a gateway, you have a server problem. In a data center, you could have a switch problem where the server is plugged in, or you can have a server problem. So can't reach the server. Try and reach the gateway. Can reach the gateway. Okay. If you can reach the server and you can reach the gateway, then send a ping to some other servers on the subnet. And if the other servers respond, guess what? Chances are you got a broken server. Why? Because if you can ping the gateway and you can ping all the other servers on the same subnet, it's most likely a broken server. Now, if you go to ping the server and the server's not there, and then you go to ping the gateway and the gateway's not there, you got to figure out where your messages got lost. So, oops, didn't mean to do that. Where would potentially would your messages be getting lost? Well, now you got to go find where your messages are going to be lost. So, if you get a response to here, great. But if you don't respond, where are your messages lost? So, now here, what you need to do is you're going to issue a trace route command. What you're going to do is you're going to find your data. You're going to see your data is going here, 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 hits this place, hits this place, and then gets lost somewhere along the way. So then let's say along the way you find out this is where the data is lost. And how do you find that it's what it's lost? It's going to look like this. And your in your trace route, you're going to you're going to see where you're going, 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 and then you're going to get star, star, star. When you see that star, star, star that I'm actually talking about, you'll see that's where it doesn't know. So when you get to that star, 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 here's where you're going to go. You're going to telnet. Well, not anymore. We use SSH now. You're going to go to this router, the router right before it, your messages got lost, and you're going to look at the routing table there. So you're going to hop on this router because you can reach this router because it's in your trace route and it's along the way. So first, let's walk through this. First reach out to the server. If the server's not there, reach out to the gateway. If the gateway is there, then reach out to some other servers on the subnet. If you can reach them, you've got a problem with the server. If you can't if you can reach the if you can't reach the gateway, you have a network problem of some kind of a problem. Now what kind of problem that is, we don't know yet. If we issue a trace route and let's say there's some connections along the way, but let's say along the way we stop here Here's the last thing we see. What we do is we go over to this router first, and we're going to look at the router. Does that route have a route to the gateway, and does it have a route back? If so, we understand. The next thing we do is we're going to go to this next router along the way, which we know is there. How do we know it's there? It's going to be in our network diagrams. It's going to be in our architecture plan. So we're going to go to this device or it'll show up as the Cisco Discovery Protocol neighbor, but that's neither here nor there. We're gonna go to this device and we're gonna see if it has a route to the gateway. And chances are it does not versus, or, or we're gonna see it may have a route to the gateway, but it may not have a route back to the on-premise. So that's typically where one of these environments is gonna break. You either have a, don't have a route to the destination, in which case the router drops your traffic, or you don't have a route back from the destination. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. And that's why we're doing a step by a step by pros. So once more, if you can't reach something, ping it. If you can't ping it, ping its default gateway. If you can't ping the default gateway, look at where the pings get lost. If the pings make it all the way to your VPC, but they don't come back from the default gateway, the default gateway might be the problem, in which case you might need to change it. So these are kind of the steps you're going to look for. So these are your main steps. Now, what else could be going wrong along the way? I've just started with the basic routing, which is realistically speaking going to be a lot of the majority of the problems. A lot of the majority of the problems are going to be just your basic routing problems. But what else could be making this complex? Access control lists, firewall rules, security groups. All that kind of stuff can make this look a lot uglier, too, and be a lot harder to find. So how, how, how are we going to do, how are we going to look at these kind of things? 
So what we need to do is get really good. So let's go back to this environment over here one more time. If you own the network and the problem exists in your environment, you can put a protocol analyzer like Wireshark or, or, and actually look at the data that's going across the wire and feel where it's gone. But in a lot of these cases, I just want you to remember, these are the steps. So how could you look and see what's actually going on? How would you get a good feel for, for what's actually going on traffic-wise? This is where your VPC flow logs come from. And your VPC flow logs will show you and it will do a really excellent job in your VPC flow logs of showing you what kind of data has been gained, what kind of data has been lost, and everywhere in between. So these are kind of some of the things we're talking about with regards to troubleshooting. It's regarding finding where your data is and finding out where your data has been lost and then being able to look at it along the way. So looks like there was a lot of questions that came in when we started to do this. So if there's a lot of questions, let me address some questions first and then uh, go back to the content. Chris, it looked like there were some questions. That came yeah, up. so uh, there, I got two questions that came in before we started going down that rabbit hole. And then we'll, we'll, we'll get the ones that came from the, uh, the, okay. uh, that, that session. So these, these two came in first. <clears throat> Question for the QA section, which is faster AWS enhanced networking or elastic fabric adapter? Long term, I think it's going to be the elastic fabric adapter um, because that can go up to 400 gigabits per second. But right now that driver is less, is, is not as fast. I want to confirm this as a hundred gig network is a hundred gig network card. So I'm pretty sure it's limited like 40 gigs, but hold on one second. I don't want to, I don't actually want to be, uh, I don't want to get it wrong um, because I know they've changed this a couple of times and they're very, very, very uh, um, limited in terms of the performance that they actually say that it can do. In fact, going to their page right now, they don't even give you any information on, on it whatsoever um, with regards to the speed. It's more of one of the traditional AWS. Trust me, this is the right solution. We've done it. It's better. It's faster. So. Enhanced networking does go to 100 gigabit per second. The last time I checked, I think it was 30 or 40 gigabits per second that was achieved on the elastic fabric adapter. But I don't have that one in front of me. I believe it's the AWS enhanced networking. And because the way it was set up, the way the AWS elastic fabric adapter was, we've reserved the ability to do this kind of performance at some point in the future. I don't believe currently it equates to the hardware performance. I think it's about half the speed of the hardware the last time I remember, but that's going off of memory. Because if you look at their page right now, it's not even shown. Question, is the equivalent of NetFlow in the cloud? Um, it's a NetFlow, the equivalent is more like VPC flow logs, Aqua. It's very similar to, uh, to NetFlow to give you some information. CloudWatch is, to me, I, I consider CloudWatch to be more like those syslogs files that we would get from the routers and VPC flow logs. To me, Aqua feel just like NetFlow in many cases, nearly identical to NetFlow. Great question there, Aqua. Manish, do you need to allow all ports for outbound to achieve SSH? Um, you shouldn't. Um, you should be able to just get away with the source port. Um, was the, the specific source and then unlimited destination ports. If you, in generally speaking, next question, Chris. Yeah. So these came in while you were talking about the, uh, what's, what's blocking the, uh, pings. And so okay. a couple of people were asking about firewalls. It could always be a firewall or an access controller. Yeah. So it could always be, but if it stopped out of nowhere, um, it's probably not, unless there was uh, some change that occurred. Mike, on the cloud, will the server fail a health check? Well, it'll fail a health check if there's a health check set up and if it's using a load balancer, but there's not always health checks involved in your servers necessarily. So it's quite possible that they're not going to fail a health check. They just won't be available. Nagaraj Rao, well, you know, you're going to know your routers. Generally speaking, most routers respond to trace routes. And the reason they do is all of us network engineers and architects need to make them that way. 
because otherwise we'll never be able to debug our networks. Now, having said that, once we get past the organization's firewall, we typically um, hide it. But if that's the case, Nagaraj Rao, you're still going to be fine because the people in the organization can go to the organization and do a trace route towards you. And then you can do a trace route towards them. And then hopefully you can find that stop where you can mix in the middle. So remember, we're, I'm showing you one side, but I'm going to be at the data center side where I'm going to the cloud. But there's nothing to preclude me from going to the cloud through the management console and then initiating some ping or, or command line or SSHing into some other boxes in that network and then checking the other way around. So that's how we're going to do it. We're going to bypass both series of firewalls and two different protection places. And that way we'll build ourselves a map checking both ways. Chris, do you want to bring in the next one? Nitropan, are the architects responsible to ensure the neck dark diagram is always updated? Um, no. So Nitropan, we architects design it. So it might be that I consult with a bank and I design their systems and I design the network and document it the way it is. But I go and I go to a new client and I go to a new client and I go to a new client. Somebody responsible has to maintain those network diagrams. So that's typically going to be the network engineers, the cloud engineers, the people that are building it. As they build it, they update the diagram. There should be a change process. In fact, it's impossible to achieve five nines or 99.999% availability without an extensive change management process. Change management is prior to making a change, I raise a flag with everybody in the organization. Is anybody going to be using the computer systems on Wednesday at four o'clock in the morning? No? Okay. Is any batch jobs running at Wednesday at four o'clock in the morning? I plan to make this routing change at Wednesday at 4.02 in the morning. Is this going to affect anybody? Okay, no. Okay, I'll be making this change. I made this change at 4.02 in the morning. Everybody, you've been notified, please check your systems. So that's typically what's done in a high availability environment. Constant updating of the documentation and constant change management. Unfiltered, unscheduled, uncareful change management will cause outages like you can't imagine. So Nitroman, yes, the, our, our, our diagrams will always be updated, but usually by the engineers that are on site. And there needs to be an extensive change management process. Chris, if you want to bring in the next one. That's the last one. OK, great. So we'll go back to content. And we can do some debugging kind of things and whiteboard it out as a group and work through it together later. And you guys can tell me what you like if you, if you desire. I'll find a couple of cool, fun ways to do it as a group. But we can do that today. I just want to make sure that everybody understands. Let's talk a little bit about CloudWatch, especially since the CloudWatch versus VPC flow log questions just popped up. So what is CloudWatch? So for those of you that have been around AWS, you already know. But for those of you that are not, that you, this is your networking is your first place, let's talk about it. So CloudWatch is a monitoring service that monitors AWS resources. But you can also use it to monitor applications that, uh, what, what are you really talking about, that you deploy on AWS. So CloudWatch is going to have some built-in metrics. And you can use it to monitor performance, troubleshoot issues, monitor applications. And you've got your built-in metrics and your cloud and your and your custom metrics. <clears throat> By default, CloudWatch has some built-in metrics that are really, really limited. CPU utilization, disk read write in terms of IOPS or operations, input output operations per second, and network utilization. And that's it. Everybody gets this. It's free, it's standard. CloudWatch is great, but that's your basic monitoring, and it is basic, basic, basic. No. Well, basic CloudWatch probably isn't enough. AWS lets you come up with these custom CloudWatch metrics, which are really good. And you can look at things like memory utilization, API performance, and almost anything you'd ever need to know. So CloudWatch gets really great. Built-in, awfully basic, custom metrics, very good capabilities. And CloudWatch is really great because it, it has this notification system, and it'll notify you things are gone wrong. And because of these CloudWatch notifications, events, um, event bridge, something very similar in concept, but you're getting these notifications, you're getting these events, and as these events occur, we can automate the remediation of them. So CloudWatch events notices something, 
trigger auto scaling. CPU hit 85%, auto scale. Hmm, somebody did this thing, insecure. Set up a Lambda function to secure a private S3 bucket. So the point is, is these actions that you can take, you can create an event-driven environment based upon CloudWatch. So not only is it providing monitoring, but it can be the impetus to fix something for you automatically. So these are why these things are really so great. You can fix it. So we'll talk about the two flavors of CloudWatch you can choose. You can choose the basic monitoring and the detail monitoring. Basic monitoring gives you data every five minutes. Now, here's the thing. Every five minutes of data you would think would be great. You would really think you're really great. But here's the thing. When you're looking at information every five minutes, you might not get the information you need. So for example, I've debugged a lot of networks in my life. And networks break when one of two things happen. The CPU and the routers go to 100% or no traffic can get across the wire because your links are completely broken and, uh, and, and, and things you run into these kind of two challenges. What happens is if, for example, the CPUs are busy on the router for three seconds, they cause a recalculation of the routes, which are, which are a nightmare. But if you're pulling your routers only every five minutes in the average, your routers might be at 3%, 100%, 5%, 100%, 20%, 100%. And if you're polling every five minutes, you're gonna get an average. When you aggregate the data down, you lose a lot of information. And when you lose a lot of this kind of information, what ultimately occurs, you're not in a position to find the problem. So basic monitoring data every five minutes, possibly not good enough to get what you need. But CloudWatch gives you detailed monitoring, which enables you to get data once a minute. Now you pay extra for it once a minute, Detailed monitoring and getting frequent access to information really, really can help you debug things when they're broken. So this detailed monitoring is going to be enabled at the EC2 instance level, and it's going to give you a lot of capabilities. So with anything else, you know, do you need that kind of monitoring? If you're a big organization, you've got lots of people and lots of systems, you need these detailed monitoring for some of your critical systems. So you're the architect. Build what the client needs. Build what helps people get better. That's what you do. It's all based upon the client's need. There's nothing that drives your solution other than the transforming the customer's business. How do you help your customer? That's the tech you use. The tech doesn't drive anything. The business drives everything. So let's talk a little bit more about Cloud Watch events. This basically is going to be a stream, literally speaking, a stream of real-time events and you'll create a match event so something happens take an action something happens take an action now that we're we've talked about cloud watch let's discuss the cloud trail piece the auditing piece so cloud trail is going to be a service that's going to help out with auditing and it's going to provide an audit log that's going to give you some assistance with risk management compliance and CloudTrail is going to track the changes that are made by everybody. So logging. So monitoring from CloudWatch, auditing from CloudTrail. Now, CloudTrail will give you an event history. And pretty much it's going to show you everything that's occurred and all the changes that are made in the last 90 days, which is a pretty great way to figure out what broke. Now, there are times where you'd like to know more. Maybe you're part of a regulated industry. Maybe you want to do long-term trends. Maybe your organization measures everything. You can actually set up the cloud trail to store your logs in S3 so you can keep these logs for long periods of time. And organizations might want to analyze their logs and see what they can learn from their logs. So for these kinds of organizations that want to do some learning, you know, storing these logs is a great thing, or these audit trails is a great thing. Now, when you set up cloud trail, you kind of have a couple of environments. Excuse me. You've got the concept of a trail that you put to one region and a trail that applies to all regions. So when you create a trail, your first thing, simplest thing is to create a trail for a single region. CloudWatch will store all the logs in a single bucket, and this is going to be the default option. Now, if you need more comprehensiveness, you can create a trail that applies to all regions. 
And this is going to provide really comprehensive logging and auditing information. It's going to record, literally speaking, all the events that ins occur inside of an organization's infrastructure. It can help an organization correlate events. That's why we're doing this, the correlation. This occurred, this outage occurred. This change occurred, this problem occurred. That's the point of the logs. That's the point of auditing. We want insight into fixing things. So when stuff isn't working right, part of your troubleshooting process is look at your logs. Logs, logs, more logs. What are the logs telling you? What is in here? Now take these logs, mine these logs. Maybe use a grep, set in a NUC, Linux things to parse through it. Maybe you have another pre main more commercial tool. Parse through your logs. You got an outage that occurs at 237? See what happened at 237. See what happened at 236. See what happened at 235. What changes could have occurred? What one thing did you see? What one thing here occurred in one part of the network that reverberated all over the network? Networks are dynamic. You throw a stone in a pond, it doesn't just go in, it creates waves. Networks create waves. So you got to look around. That's why we're looking logs. When that stone gets thrown in, look at the wave. What did the effect of the wave had on the water have on all the surrounding areas? That's why we're looking at logs. That's how you troubleshoot. You become methodical. You look at the data. Data, data, and more data. Where do you get your data? Your logs. Let's talk about some of the more common network problems that you're going to have and some of the fixes. <clears throat> Most commonly, routers get misconfigured. I got to tell you, in uh, a long, long, long time working in tech, I've seen a whole lot of misconfigured routers. Simplest solution is knowing what you're doing. When you're dealing with routers, it's, not, it's almost never that you made a typo. It's usually the person doesn't know what to type. Think um, Facebook. Think about their BGP outage. Someone made a misconfiguration. For the most part, the routers don't even let you type in a mistake. They let you type in things that are wrong. Um, that won't work in your situation or weren't working properly, but it's not like you can make too many typos. Um, you can't put an IP address of 1.1.1.1.1. It won't let you. It knows it's 32 bits. So, you know, a lot of these things are there, but, you know, that's a perfect example of not knowing what to do. An $8 billion outage due to a misconfiguration. I've seen more misconfiguration problems in the problem. The configuration error is one of your big things. A link goes down. You buy a link between New York and London, the link goes down. You call the service provider, they fix the, fix the link. Usually, if you've got an outage and it worked yesterday and nobody made a configuration change, something's down and chances are it's the link. Okay, now, routers. The routers are computers. Sometimes these computers don't work the way they need to and, re and, need, and, and have a process that crashes. Hmm. Got a Windows computer. It crashes too. Now, what do you do when your Windows computer gets unreliable? You reboot it. You know what? On a router, we don't reboot them. And yet, if you call your favorite router vendor and you call them and you tell them you have a problem, most likely they're going to find a bug ID somewhere. A bug ID. And they're going to tell you to reinstall a newer version of the operating system, which is going to force a reboot. And when it reboots, the systems get better. So was it the reboot and the bug ID? Was it the bug ID and new software that fixed the problem or the reboot? I'm going to tell you, I hate doing it, but if I try everything and I can't figure it out, I do a system reboot before I even call tech. Why? Because if it's down, it's down. And very frequently, you've got a process on a router, and the process just needs to be restarted. And you're not always in a position where it's, what's it like on a Linux machine where you do a system TCL, something to restart, where you've got to restart a process. You can't always do that on a router. So sometimes the easiest thing to do is to just reboot it. So there's that. Router process crashed. Now, the next thing is common network problems. You don't have a route to something, which is why you got to look at the routing table because most of the time, if you can't reach it, you just don't have a route. Now, when you're dealing with connections to the cloud, your dedicated connection is going to go down. Your IPsec tunnel goes down. Usually, it means your internet connection is down, but it could be related to your security key. And let's talk a little bit about some security problems. Now, these are going to be problems you're going to see all the time. 
you're going to misconfigure an access control list. That's going to get you. You're going to misconfigure a security group. You're going to have really good security appliances, and your security appliance is going to look at your application and think your application is behaving like an, a hacking event and shut it down. Um, so, you know, there, there's that. And then uh, you could put some software on your server that blocks ports to something else, or you could have an incorrect IAM policy. So realistically speaking, you know, these are, are kind of these kind of the, the things that we're trying to talk about. So I'm going to talk about hybrid cloud architectures next. But, you know, I'm not sure if we need to address any questions before we talk about hybrid cloud architectures. We typically uh, have, uh, a fa we have some time today. Chris, is there anything I need to address? Yeah, we've got uh, one question so far. I'm sure there'll be uh, a couple more as we answer. Here we go. How do you lose information when aggregating? Okay, sure, Asim. So if you... Uh, if you, if, you, if you look for the average of what is something every five minutes, what do you do? You take everything combined and you average it out, which means you're going to get an average. So if you've got 12 slices of information per hour, you've got 12 slices of information, which means that each slice of information can only give you so much. Now, let's see if instead of having a slice of information every five minutes, you had a slice of information every minute, you would have 12 times the information. Now you would by getting 60 of them versus getting 12. So by having more and more frequent polling, you're gonna have much more information. When you average things out, you lose information. So uh, the best way I can describe it is, if I give you five numbers, 10, 11, nine, 10, 11, nine, 10, and 10, you could say the average is 10, or you could say you have three tens, a nine and an 11. That would be much more accurate and it would be much more informational. Or you could just say the average is 10. So it seems, Hans, that's what we're really talking about. I'm not sure even how to answer that question, but uh, when you apply a cloud trail for all regions, you can get pretty specific into what you're looking for. So uh, verbose is uh, up to, it, it has a, has a, has, can be a lot of different things. So. Okay, let's go to hybrid cloud architectures, unless there is any more questions. If there's any more questions, let's talk about them. No more questions so far. Okay, then let's talk about hybrid cloud architectures. And then we'll talk about some disaster recovery, which is something that I think is really great with the cloud. So what is hybrid cloud architecture? And there's really two things, and there's lots of reasons why organizations would do a hybrid cloud architecture. A hybrid cloud is when you combine the data center and the cloud. Now, there's two definitions of a hybrid cloud. The first definition, which is not necessarily my definition, but some people would just say that anybody that has a data center that connects to the cloud has a hybrid cloud. And the reality is the data center, the cloud, they're the same. Servers, switches, networks, load balancers, firewalls, IDS, IPS systems. The only difference is the data center is physical and the cloud has been virtualized. So let's talk about why organizations would do this concept of the hybrid cloud. And let's talk about ways that we can make the hybrid cloud even cooler. So why would an organization use a hybrid cloud? Why not just shut down the data center and put everything on the cloud? Let's talk about it. Well, let's think about latency. Which has less latency, 100 feet away from me or 1,000 miles away from me, 100 feet away from me? So the data center, if it's where your users are, is going to have less latency and better performance than the cloud. There's just that. Let's talk about what else is about the data center. In the data center, we can promote the most extreme security because we can control everything. If I want to hire Navy SEALs, SAS commandos uh, that are armed to guard my data center, I can do that. If I want to put every user in their own VLAN so they, with a policy that says they can't talk to anybody, I can do that. 
If I want to use MAC address authentication in my data center so that you can't plug in something that's not official, I can do that. If I need 10 million IOPS from a drive side, hard drive speed, I can do that in the data center. I can't do any of this in the cloud. But so realize that the data center gives us some benefits. Now, also, let's look at our data center. Maybe an organization has 100,000 servers already in their data center. Maybe the organization has a tremendous number of remote access employees coming into their data center. Maybe that data center needs to be connected to a lot of other organizations. So there's lots of good reasons that organizations would want to keep their current data center. So by keeping their current data center, if an organization's invested a billion dollars in technology, they can continue to use that technology, leverage that billion dollars of technology, and then offload to the cloud for what the cloud can do better. Or the organization can keep using their data center and use the cloud for disaster recovery. Or the organization can do what they do best in their data center and move it across their data center. So realistically speaking, what we're talking about really, really, really is gonna be as follows. We're talking about making sure that we have everything right. So these are the things that we're talking about. One second. So these are the reasons why we're talking about it. So what are your ways to create the hybrid clouds? You're gonna have two options. Option one is gonna be this, data center and cloud. Option two, which I like better, is this. Turn that data center into a cloud. Get from Nutanix or OpenStack. Get yourselves a cloud software environment. Install the cloud on your data center. Connect your data center, which is now a full cloud computing environment, which has all the benefits of auto scaling, all the benefits, all the virtualization, all the simplicity, all the elegance. Connect your cloud to another cloud. That's the magic of the hybrid cloud. The IBM solution is the hybrid cloud. The Nutanix solution is the hybrid cloud. The hybrid cloud is amazing. It gives you the ability to get all the benefits of the data center, which is the performance and all the scalability, all the agility, all the magic of the cloud and your data center. It's the best of both worlds. And cloud provider tries to raise your rates by cloud provider. I'll bring it back into my data center. So. It's the simplest and the most elegant. And oh, by the way, when your cloud engineers configure things in your OpenStack cloud, for example, it will automatically provision other clouds as well. So if you use the right software to provision it, you can make sure your, your, your content is in your cloud, two, three other clouds. They're simple, they're elegant, and they mend together. So realistically speaking, that's kind of why we're doing these kind of things. So now let's look, for example, of what it looks like from a hybrid cloud perspective, it's gonna look something like this. It's gonna be a, you've got your system, you can see in the data center, you've got your environment to your, direct, your data center, and that's why you've got two environments. You've got your cloud environment, and you've got your data center. Now, that's typically speaking um, in a good environment, and it makes all good, Chris. Okay, so that's just what I wanted to, so let's, Let's talk about, you know, ways that you can actually do your hybrid data center and why. One of the things that you could do is a hybrid data center offload. So think about it this way. The company, they maintain their current data center and they do what their data center does great. They then set up a VPC and in their VPC, they do something to replicate. So let's say the web. Let's say an organization has their data center, their data center is great, but their data center gets busy and they need a little more capacity. So maybe for example, you set up your data center as is, and then you set up a DNS policy or if you're using AWS, a Route 53 policy that says 75% of the data center, 25% of the cloud. And that way, if it's like right after Thanksgiving and big shopping weeks, you can get people to the products they need at the AWS site or the Azure site or the Google site while still maintaining their data center. Holiday events, big promotions, this is really great. And, oh wait, what does it really help the customer do? What do customers do in the data center? We build for peak 
What do we do on the cloud that makes the cloud so good? The cloud we can build for average and auto scale. So we can do the same thing with our hybrid cloud. We can build our data center for average, and then we can send extra to the cloud. So think about data center performance, cloud agility married together, hybrid cloud data center offload. That's one great situation to use a hybrid cloud. Now let's talk about disaster recovery. The cloud is honestly one of the best ways for disaster recovery I've ever seen in 25 years of technology. When it comes to disaster recovery, we've got four really, really good options. So hybrid cloud, disaster recovery. The cloud is by far the best disaster recovery I have ever seen in my entire life. So let's talk about the four disaster recovery options for cloud computing and why the cloud is by far the best disaster recovery in the world. So let's talk about the cheapest, cheapest cloud disaster recovery center. The cheapest disaster recovery in the world is we keep our happy data centers, they're running along smooth, serving content to the world, doing everything the businesses need. And we take a backup of every virtual machine we have and we stick it in the cloud. We back up our database and we store it all in the cloud. Now in the cloud, we have copies of the images of our virtual machines and our data and say once a day, we back up our data to the cloud. I want you to understand how elegant this is. You make a copy of every virtual machine you have. Once a day, you copy your data to the cloud or you keep a copy like once a day, you update the data on the cloud. And for basically nothing, you have the ability to bring your systems up in about 12 hours and be refreshed with whatever the most current day's information is, no more than 24 hours old, for basically nothing. For something that can be set up in, almost instantly, something that is extremely inexpensive, Within 12 hours, you're up and running on the cloud for almost no money in terms of disaster recovery. There is nothing else in the world that can do this at this speed. So we love it, or this price. That is the first option for disaster recovery. Now, your next option for disaster recovery is still really cheap. It's, I'd say, 10% faster, and the data is more current, but it's still really cheap, really elegant, but it's still going to take you 8, 10, 12 hours to come back up. And here, basically, you do the same thing. You keep your data center. You make images of all your main servers, which you store on the cloud. And you keep a database synchronized. And the database is synchronized in two places. It's synchronized in your data center, and it is synchronized in the cloud. And by keeping your databases synchronized in both connections, here's what you're finding. You're finding that your data, sync, your data is updated date on the cloud, and of course, if you needed to launch these things, because you've got images of your data in the databases that are on the cloud, all you need to do is launch your machines and your databases are synchronized. So now you're dealing with about eight to 12 hours to come up. So option one, just a backup of everything. Option two, backup of everything, but keep your databases synchronized. Now, next is where we get into the awesome, awesome, awesome level of, of disaster recovery. So. This next version, and I'm not going to use terms like hot or pilot or warm. I want you to understand what they are, not industry jargon. The number three option, which is my favorite, is a medium cost option, and it gives you the best. And this is basically where you have your main data center up and running, put capacity in your data center. On the cloud, you set up a replica of your environment. You use a bunch of small instances, you put them in an auto scaling group, you synchronize your databases and you make a low performance replica of your data center, low performance. And it sits there and it runs idle, low performance copy, so it's cheap. Then here's what happens. Something happens to your data center. DNS detects an outage. The outage then redirects to the cloud. The traffic gets to the cloud, it overwhelms the cloud because you made a replica of what you have. But that traffic overwhelms the cloud. As the traffic overwhelms the cloud, your auto scaling policy kicks in. 45 minutes later, your load balancers, your servers, they're all scaled out. And 45 minutes later, 
you've got a fully functioning data center in the cloud, fully functioning data center in the cloud. And with that, your systems are up, your systems are running in 45 minutes. So wow, think about this. Low cost option, little mini data center you have running around, real cheap to run, sits there, does pretty much nothing. You get a failure in your main data center and poof, within 45 minutes, your business is up. It's operational. Just think about that. Up and operational, literally speaking, in a matter of an hour with no manual intervention for a relatively low cost. This is why cloud disaster recovery is the best in the world. Nothing, nothing, nothing can compete with that. And then the last form of disaster recovery is the same kind of disaster recovery we've done in the data center environment forever. There are organizations that have such requirements for performance and availability that if their main data center fails, their backup data center needs to be up and running within say two minutes. For these special customers, here's how you set it up from a disaster recovery perspective. Whatever you have in the data center, you have in the cloud. If you've got a thousand web servers in the data center with 128 cores and four terabytes around, you have a thousand web servers in the cloud with 128 cores and four terabytes around. If you have 80 application load balancers, you're gonna have 80 application load balancers. You've got a 40 terabyte Apache Cassandra database in the data center, you're gonna have that same 40 terabyte Apache Cassandra database in the cloud, synchronized. Everything is identical. That hot standby kind of thing where you've got one that's rolling full time and you got another one, the active, active, whatever kind of term you want to use it, that works. Now that gets expensive. So let's review the four again. Disaster recovery is awesome. And the cloud makes disaster recovery so much better. Option one, backup only. Back up your data, back up your images of your servers, stick them in the cloud. Option two, a little better. Back up all your servers, back up all your data, but keep your databases synchronized. Option number three, replica of what you have in your data center in the cloud with an auto scaling policy. Cloud fail, your data center fails, information gets shifted over to the cloud. Cloud scales up. Option four, whatever you have active is whatever you have active. Okay, everyone, first, and then I'm gonna make you work through some problems. So everybody, let's talk about this. Let me know that you're still paying attention by typing Cloud hired in the chat box, and then I'm going to ask you some questions. I want to see exactly whether you're truly grasping this data center versus cloud thing and their similarities in the disaster recovery. So let me know you're here by talking by an official cloud hired. Excellent. So I can see you're you're here, you're paying attention. And now that I know, oh, is that is I hope that's the Georgette that I know that I haven't seen in a little while that's here. Um, so wonderful to see you guys here um, from all over the world. I know your names and know where you're at, at least a lot of you, and I'm really happy to see so many people. So let's go back and think about this. So let's walk through this. Here's a here's a we'll call it a, a thought problem for you. Here's my data center. Here's the cloud. Your jet, I am so happy to see you here. I hope, I hope, I hope to see you Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. in class. I'm so happy to see you. Okay, so here's your data center and your cloud. Now, let's go back to option three. In option three, here's what we have. We have our full data center, and we have small versions of everything in the cloud. Let's use AWS DNS for right now. It doesn't matter whose DNS we're at. So let's call it Route 53. So we've got AWS DNS here. The DNS runs its health checks. 
Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? The data center does not answer. DNS shifts the traffic to the cloud. Now, we, because option three, we have small instances. Auto scaling occurs, and we've got servers. They're working real hard. They're coming up. They're coming up. They're coming up. Now, we've got a big cloud. Our data center is gone, and everything is redirected to the cloud. Okay, everyone. Now, we've just blown up our data center completely. Um, the data center was in a building. We need to knock down the data center to build some beautiful condos. So we hired some people. They, uh, they put uh, some explosives in the building. The building's been imploded. We hired a construction crew. We're building a new skyscraper building, and it's going to be beautiful. We've taken all of our servers, everything we have. It's all now sitting in AWS. Everything's here in AWS. Now, everybody, can I do the same version that I just did? Can I make small instances on Azure of the virtual machines that I have in the data center, but now my data center is AWS. Can I come up with an auto scaling group policy in Azure? Can I treat my AWS environment identical to the data center and then fail over to Azure by doing the same thing? Does anything change here? Is it the same thing whether it's AWS backing up to Azure or a data center backing up to Azure? Is there any difference at all? And if so, somebody tell me the difference. Or is it just identical? It's identical. Okay, you guys get it? It is identical. There's no difference by using a cloud to a cloud as opposed to a data center to the cloud. It is identical. Why is it identical? What are you gonna stick in AWS? Your cloud stuff. What is your cloud stuff? Your servers, your containers, your firewalls, your storage. It's the same stuff. So this happens to be called multi-cloud. I don't know why, but this is called hybrid cloud. It's identical, nothing has changed. The reason people get themselves in trouble with the cloud is they're confusing what the cloud is. It's just your data center. So same things. If I wanted to do a hot, hot, and I wanted AWS and Azure to be used, can anybody, 50-50, can anybody tell me the DNS policy that I would use to use Azure and AWS 50-50? We talked about it yesterday. What is that DNS policy that sends 50% of your traffic someplace and 50% somewhere else? Somebody tell me. This is architecture. This is fun. Exactly, NitroPant. Only the performance change from the data center to the cloud. The performance will be a little better in the data center. The cloud will offer more scalability. So, Aqua, you got it, waited. Genie, waited. Yolanda, waited. Nice. Yolanda, I think you're part of the, part of the uh, what do you call it, or the, the, we're, the we're Fun group. If, I, if you're the same Yolanda, I think you are, and I'm always thrilled to have you and everyone from that group here. I love when you guys are here. So, waited, exactly. We're using a load, we're using weighted routing, which is done via DNS. Um, Azure does do cross-region load balancing, but not AWS, like I confused the other day. I work with so many clouds, it's pretty easy to do that. But remember that uh, weighted is exactly wonderful, Yolanda. Um, and you might even be in Florida like me, which if that's the case, one day we should even meet. But, you know, these are the things that we're actually talking about. So now you got it. Now let's go back. Let's go to another situation. Now let's go to... Um, Let's go to option one. So let's say here's AWS and let's say Azure. Let's say I'm looking for the cheapest, cheapest, cheapest backup in the entire world. Couldn't I just take an image of my virtual machines in AWS, convert them into an Azure virtual machine image, and then just keep a backup of my data on the cloud? Oh, Brussels, makes sense. So of course I can. So everything that I can do from the AWS environment, I can do to the cloud. Everything that I can do in the data center, I can do in the cloud. And the cloud is just a data center. So the cloud is somebody else's computer, somebody else's network. That's it. So let's talk about some of the getting your data stuff to the cloud. 
and start talking a little bit about some of these storage gateway kind of things. So if you're going to have two data centers, now you get into this ugliness of keeping your data synchronized. So this piece, really critical. And anytime you use a Mac and a Windows computer at the same time, keep your data synchronized. Two data centers data synchronized. Always the challenge is the data, data, data. So let's talk about storage gateways. So there's the concept of a storage gateway. And basically all a storage gateway is, is in your data center, you put a virtual machine that looks like a server. And you map to that server like anything else. And this basically your storage gateway, when you map to that server, you copy information to the server and it just copies it to AWS for you. And by doing this, you can keep your data synchronized. So let's talk about the kinds of ways that we're actually gonna do some of these kinds of things. We're gonna talk about a couple of different storage gateways or ways to keep your data synchronized between AWS and uh, your, your data center, regardless of where it is. So let's begin, we'll talk about the storage, the Viome gate, the file gateway, the Viome gateway storage mode and the Viome gateway cache mode. So, with regards to the storage gateway, we'll first talk about the file gateway. And that's quite just simply, it's just a server. You stick the server in the data center and you mount the server. If you're dealing with Windows, you mount it via the server message block. If you're dealing with Linux systems, you mount it via NFS. You put your information on the server and then it automatically gets copied via async asynchronously over to S3. And things are going to be encrypted with your server side encryption key or your SSE key. And it's going to look something like this. This is how you're going to keep your data connected. You've got your stuff, your servers. You connect them to your storage gateway. And your storage gateway will just copy your stuff to AWS. And like anything else, you can set up a lifecycle policy if you want. For example, you might say that I need to use my data every day for 30 days. After 30 days, I occasionally use it for 90 days. And after 90 days, I don't ever use it, but I'm keeping it around for my data lake for the future machine learning that we're going to be creating. So you could not only aggregate it, but you could create lifecycle policies for archival purposes. So <coughs> storage gateways, highly useful way to deal with these hybrid cloud environments. Now, when we're dealing with storage gateways, they're simple. We also, for these hybrid cloud environments, have the ability to deal with a volume gateway. And you know these are similar use cases. These are when you're running hybrid clouds. So we've got the opportunity to do a volume gateway in stored mode and a volume gateway in cache mode. And we'll talk about the difference. For organizations that keep the data in their data center, their bigger challenge is copying data to the cloud. So they're gonna use a volume gateway in stored mode. Now there are other organizations that keep their information mostly on the cloud and they're gonna use something called cache mode. But we're gonna talk first about volume gateways in stored mode. Remember, this is for organizations that keep the majority of their data in the data center. So the organization mounts one of these devices using the iSCSI protocol, and then they copy their data here and it gets copied over. So let's look at this option. So in this option, you've got your users, your servers, they connect to the volume gateway in store mode. And what happens is information is backed up and forms a snapshot to AWS S3. So your information gets pushed to S3. Now this is good if your users are predominantly in the data center because it's copying your information over. But what if, what if the majority of your information was stored on the cloud? Now you need something different. Now we've got these volume gateways in cache mode. And what cache mode is, is you keep your data there. You put this storage gate with this volume gateway in your data center. You mount the, the gate, volume gateway. You request information from the volume gateway, and then it pulls it from AWS. And what's really cool about this is, is computers don't use object storage. But by using a volume gateway in cache mode, it's going to make the object storage, the S3 sitting in AWS, feel usable to the computers. So here in this volume gateway cache mode, and I'm going to show you what it looks like. It's a pretty great idea. It's genius that AWS did this. You, the user, connect to this, this uh, volume gateway that's in cache mode. The users over here request some information. It gets pulled from AWS, put on the volume gateway, and then sent to the user.
But now this volume gateway caches it, kind of like a content delivery network. It keeps my request there. So when the next user, the green user, goes and requests it, they get it here. And then the next user over here in the orange shirt requests the information. The user in the orange shirt gets it. So by doing it this way, we store all our information in the cloud. In object storage, which is cheap, we pull the information from the cloud as needed. And of course, if we want to copy information to the cloud, the Viom Gateway can still push information to the cloud. But the, this mode of using it is designed to pull the information from the cloud. So by doing it this way, we can keep most of our data on the cloud and access it if it's local storage. So this, you know, really exciting stuff for those of us that are out there. Now, let's talk about extreme security information environments. Generally speaking, when you're dealing with hybrid clouds, if you've got a direct connection, it's private. Why is it private? There's nothing on the wire from you to direct connection location. And when you are going back to backhaul to AWS, you're on a different VLAN. So your information is secure, completely secure. Now, having said all of that, what if you wanted a further degree of security? You could run IPsec over your direct connections. Now, reality is people don't normally do this, but you could. So if you encrypt your data and someone gets access to your encrypted data, it's meaningless. So realistically speaking, just while you can create a VPN on public links, just know you can do it on private links too. So we'll talk a little about VPNs just so you can see the concept. I just want to show you that when you're dealing with these environments, you've got your public and your private virtual interfaces. And I know we talked about it a little bit. So for example, when we're using the VPN or any kind of connectivity for that matter, just be, be careful that you understand that the public virtual interface is going to get us to the public services, such as DynamoDB or S3. The private, which says public here, but it should be saying private over here, takes you to your VPC. So kind of keep that in mind that we're going to have public and private. So at this point, let's, do we want to talk about this? So at this point, let's, uh, let's talk about billing. And I'm not Mr. Billing because I'm more of an architect and there are people that are experts. Uh, before we go to billing, let's see if there's any questions. Um, before we go to the next section. Does anybody have any questions right now? Okay, so Nitropen, um, would you avoid the cloud-specific databases like Aurora? So Nitropen, there's always the question that you need to think about with regards to databases. Amazon Aurora is a great, great, great database, NitroPen, that has features that are a cross between the Freeware's versions and the kind of fully robust kind of database you get like an Oracle one. So the Aurora database is an excellent database. Excellent. Now, NitroPen, in my designs, I never use things like Aurora. And the reason is I like things that work in a wide variety of environments. So you know, if I'm going to look at a NoSQL database, I'd go to a database architect, but I'd like to choose something more from the Apache Cassandra or the MongoDB place. If I'm going to use a database, I'd like to use a relational database that would work on AWS, Azure, and Google. So from my perspective, I don't use vendor proprietary anything. When I worked at Cisco, and I love Cisco, I didn't use a lot of EIGRP. There were times that I used the EIGRP routing protocol because what it did in certain use cases was so good, it was the best in the world for that use case. But 90% of the time, I didn't. I used things that were open standards. So if the customer needed a Cisco device, a Juniper device, it would work together. So NitroPan, when I do my architectures, I don't just think about whose product I'm working for right now or whose product I'm selling. I always think what's in the best interest of the customer long term. So these are the kind of things that I um, that are really, really, really important to me, focusing on the customer long term. So for those reasons, I don't use things like Aurora, because if you go on Aurora and you want to leave AWS, it's going to be tough. 
Whereas if you do it on a database that you can synchronize across cloud providers, you don't have the problem. So could be done, but imagine it this way, Oracle in both locations. There's no synchronization problem that way. DynamoDB and trying to get that to integrate into Google's Cloud Bee table may maybe not be my, 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 my choice. Having said that, MongoDB in both places would be great. MongoDB in the data center, the AWS Cloud, the Azure Cloud, and the GCP Cloud all at the same time, awesome. So it's not that there's anything wrong with these things, but you gotta figure out what is in the best interest of your customer. Sometimes the serverless is in the best interest of your customer, and you should go that way. Sometimes the flexibility is in the best interest of your customer. Personally, I always go with open standards whenever I can. There's times where the open standard isn't as good as the vendor proprietary and go vendor proprietary. But I try to give my customers the maximum flexibility. I don't want to be a prisoner to somebody. And uh, once you go vendor proprietary, you all to some degree become a prisoner of that environment. And I tend not to like that. So Chris, if you want to bring in the next one. Here, Lincoln, how do you implement IPsec when connecting a data center through direct connection? So the Pierre, the way you would configure IPsec is on the routers, is the way you turn them on, it would be the same way. I've personally never seen it done over a direct connection to the cloud, but you know, IPsec is IPsec. You enable it on the routers the same way you would enable it in any other environment, which is something I haven't done in a long period of time, but it's done via the command line. Chris, there's others? To run out, how do you uh, how do you implement a VPN connection? Um, IPsec, you know, for any of you guys that are not sure, go to the Cisco website. On the Cisco website, you can just do configuring IPsec. Basically, you create a tunnel interface. You correct this tunnel endpoint and a tunnel thing. You select the encryption keys and the encryption protocols, and then you're done. So this is just simple networking. How do you enable IPsec? And the good news is, is you know, in a lot of cases, the the cloud providers actually spit out a configuration for you. But it might actually not be your traditional IPsec because, you know, a lot of things are on a VLAN. So there's lots of places where you can create a tunnel between your environment and the cloud. Plus, you can also create GRE tunnels and you can encrypt those with IPsec too. So there's a couple of different ways you might have to deal with these things when they get fairly complicated. Is IPsec overkill in a direct connection? Generally speaking, yes. Um, that's why I've never done it. I'm just saying it could be done, but I've never encrypted pr a private line before. So it's more of a theoretical of doing it. There's good reasons to do so. I've just never needed to do so. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about billing. Now, I am not Mr. Billing, but I'm going to talk about Mr. Billing. When I discuss billing, remember a lot of these things are there for the cloud providers. When real network people that are traditional network people look at cloud provider billing, ooh, we shudder a little bit. Now, we have to understand that the cloud providers are doing a great service and they're providing a cost-effective service. It just feels strange to we traditional networking people because to we traditional networking people, we pay a lot to build it and then the use of it's basically free. Where in the cloud, it doesn't cost as much to build it, but the use of it is really expensive. So let's talk about network services. Now, AWS bills for network services very differently than it is for traditional networking. AWS bills for three components. They bill for basically a service or a port fee, which is like a fee to have the switch port on the switch. They bill you a data processing fee, which is basically when you actually use your NAT gateways and your load balancers. And they charge data transfer fees, which is charging you to, for your data to traverse the network. So got to keep these in mind. Now, on VPN connections, it is not like a traditional VPN. Typically speaking, you pay for your internet service provider on both sides, you create your IPsec tunnel on the routers, and there is no charge ever other than your internet connection. Not so here. So for every hour that you even have the tunnel up, you're charged a fee just to have the tunnel. And then you're actually charged to use the tunnel. All outbound traffic leaving your VPC is billed. On the way in, they don't charge. They're not going to charge you to send your data to them. They're going to charge you to take your data away. So keep that in mind. Now, the next version is your direct connection. For every hour that you have a direct connection, you're charged a fee. 
And every time you use the direct connection outbound, you're charged a fee. So again, this is not like you buy a private line. You have it, you use it, and that's it. You buy the line, then you pay to have the line. So you're always going to pay to have the line. But normally, you just pay to have the line. Here, you're going to pay to have the line. You're going to pay a daily fee to have the line. And then you're going to pay to use the line. So keep this in mind. Remember, AWS has to make money somewhere. So they charge you to use the networks that you buy from somebody else. So just kind of keep that in mind. It's not that they're doing anything wrong. How else could they survive? So this is the way they are. Now, when we're dealing with direct connections versus VPN connections, kind of important to remember it this way. The billing rate of the direct connection per megabyte or per gigabyte is often cheaper than it actually is the VPN. So while VPNs are typically cheaper, when you're sending a lot of data, it's often cheaper to actually use a direct connection than a VPN. Because remember, with a cloud, you don't just pay to have it. You pay to actually use it, and that's the difference. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, what other things are you going to pay for? There's the concept, and we talked a lot about private link, you know, where we're creating an elastic network interface, and we're creating that private connection instead of VPC peering, and, we're and we talked about that before. When you create a private link environment, you're, charging, you're charged for every hour that your interface endpoint exists, so every hour. And you're also going to be charged for data that gets used. Now, the last thing that we'll talk about on uh, on some of these service and port hour fees are the NAT gateway. Now, there's a NAT gateway, um, I mean, how you connect to the internet for egress only coming back. There's a charge for the NAT gateway as long as it exists. There's a charge for the amount of traffic used by the gateway, and that the, the and then there's so tra charge for the tra traffic that's processed and the traffic that's sent through the NAT. So you're going to pay three times. You're going to pay for the traffic. So you're going to pay for the NAT gateway, and they're going to pay for the processing of the traffic. Let's talk about some other fees that are in the networking world with regards to load balancers. You're charged every hour that the uh, load balancer is in operation. You're charged in terms of capacity units, meaning how much it's used. Basically, it's a combination of traffic flows, bandwidth uses, and the rules and the load balancers. And then let's talk about some more data transfer charges. So. Anytime the traffic goes to the internet, you're billed. Anytime your traffic goes from one region to another, it's billed. And that's why if you have got a static website, S3 cross-region replication, keeping your data in two places, as opposed to constant going back and forth where the traffic might be cheaper. This is why CloudFront can be cheaper because it could limit the inter-regional traffic transfer charges. And then, of course, if you're going to use CloudFront, they're going to charge you every time outbound data goes to the edge locations to the customers. So you're... It's none like a normal network. With a normal network, you pay to build the network and then use is free. Here, you're paying a little to build the network because you still need the information, but you're gonna pay a whole lot to actually use it. So when people say the cloud is OPEX and the data center is CAPEX, it doesn't mean that OPEX is cheaper. If you use the cloud a lot, it's gonna be cheaper to have the data center. So the key is you are the architect. What is in the best interest of your customer? What's more agile? What's more flexible? What helps your customers' revenue? What cuts your customers' costs? What gives your customers the agility they need? I don't know what that is until I interact with the customer. Only they know what's critical to their business. And only once you know what's critical to their business are you in the position to transform their businesses. So you've got to ask those questions because otherwise it's all conjecture. It's all theory. Got to go cloud. Got to go cloud. People ask me, how do I convince people to the cloud? I say, I don't convince people to go anywhere. I ask the customer, where is your best place? What are you trying to achieve? And then I find the best solution for them. And if it's cloud, I'm taking them there. And I love the cloud. And if it's not the cloud, I'm keeping them in their data center. And if it's a data center that's a hybrid cloud, it's whatever it is. None of this is driven by the vendors. All of this is driven by what benefits your customers. Solve customer problems. You have the best architecture career in the world. The world will knock down your door looking for you. Don't get married to a vendor. Get married to your customers. So. Let's talk about some more charges. If a public, if you're using a public IP address, um, realistically speaking, then there's a data transfer charge. If you're going in between availability zones, there's a charge. Any data in between VPC pairing sessions is a charge. So get it? 
There's a charge for everything. There's nothing on the cloud that's free. All those other things that would be free in the data center, you're charged for. So you have to analyze these charges. As an architect, how can you minimize these charges? What can you do to minimize the transfers between the regions? These are the kind of things that we need to do. So let's talk a little bit about budgeting, and then we'll talk about some high availability designs. When you're planning things, you kind of need to know. So I, I don't configure a lot of things on the cloud because I'm an architect. But the first thing that I do when I go to the cloud is I set up a budget. I set up a budget alert. Why do I do it? It's real easy to forget what your systems are doing. And you don't want to get a $10 million bill at the end of the day or month for what you, what, or week for what you've spent. So you set up a budget. The budget will have customer alerts. It'll give you billing and management information. And you'll find out before you exceed it. So organizations should set up a budget. It's how they manage. Now, AWS always wants to talk about Trusted Advisor. And let's be fair, all the vendors have tools like this. The Trusted Advisor is an AWS tool. And this AWS tool is designed to help you make better decisions. And what it's going to do is it's going to scan your infrastructure. And it'll compare your infrastructure to best practices. And then it'll make recommendations on performance, security improvements, infrastructure costs. It's automated. We'll talk about that. And with this, you've got two versions of Trust Advisor. You've got the basic and developer support plan, which gives you six security checks and 50 service limit checks. And for the customers that buy business support plans or enterprise support plans, they get a lot. They get 115 Trusted Advisor checks, 14 cost optimization checks, 17 for security, 24 fault tolerance, 10 performance, 50 service limits. Here's the thing. It is an automated service that's going to make recommendations. It's automated. So automated doesn't mean a lot. It will give you information and you should evaluate it. Some of this information will be very valuable. Some of it will be worthless. It's kind of like an e-prescribing application. I go to write an e-prescription for a patient. I get 50 alerts. Guess what? The person's blood pressure is high. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they have high blood pressure. They have high blood pressure. You sure you want to give this drug with high blood pressure? Yes, I need to give this drug with high blood pressure. How about this alert? 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 So now doctors write a prescription and they get the 50 alerts every day that they knew about anyway, but that's necessary to do their job. When you start using these tools, you get a whole bunch of recommendations. And you got to look at the recommendations as an expert and say, these 47 recommendations are all wrong. These two are right. Wow, this is great. So tools help you but they don't replace thinking. It's like a subnet calculator. If you need to use it, you shouldn't be doing IP addressing. Now, I don't have a problem if somebody uses a subnet calculator. It's just that you need to know the numbers and it can be a tool, not a crutch. Same kind of thing here. The trusted advisor is gonna give you ideas. And some of these ideas are gonna be really great. But, 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 they're automated and automated anything is never the same as properly designed and customized. So just keep that in mind. So are there any questions now? And after this, we'll talk about some high availability design. Marla. So is this where you start quantifying the ROI of the customer? We design based upon their needs. Do we talk numbers or calculate as part of sales? So Marla, most of the time, if you're an architect, you're going to meet with the client as part of the sales team. The first thing you need to do is figure out the customer's challenges. What's the customer trying to do and why? If the customer wants a new website, why? Is their current website working? If so, what's the current website doing? How many billions of dollars in sales are they doing in the current website? Is it that the current website can't keep up with the demand and they're losing you know, 10% of the customers? And if they've done $37 billion of e-commerce sales and they can't, they're losing 10% of sales. We can estimate that $3.7 billion of sales were lost. And then, Marla, if we can design a solution that costs less than $3.7 billion, then the customer will buy that because that will give them increased sales. The ROI starts at the beginning. You need to figure out what is the problem. Only once you know what the problem is can you even begin to quantify the problem. You deal with a hospital that's got a thousand nurses that deals with an additional $70 million of overtime per nurses per year. You've got $70 million of budget to play with. Can you cut down the nurse, the nursing overtime? So 
you got to start with quantum with the client you got to start by knowing what's the client's goals once 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 you actually know what the goals are then you can quantify those goals and then you can quantify the value of a solution that will do that long before you even think of the solution so first you need to know what the goals are then you need to know what how you can solve those goals and only when you know what you can solve and um, you can determine what the expected value or the likelihood of success of your design working is. And if you guys want, maybe we'll do an expected value of return on investment capital today. I think we can do it. I think we'll have some time if you guys desire to do a little whiteboard session by the end of this, if we have time. I'm not sure if we have time, but we might be able to do that. If not, I know that our students in our cloud architect career development program do this periodically in class. So one of the ways we'll make sure we get you to do that. Chris, bring up the next one. Do companies mostly hire, go with TECO? I don't know what TECO is. Um, so if you tell me, I can definitely answer. It popped up the second part of the question. You just need to read it. Recommend it. Do most companies go with the TECO? Recommendation of the architect is back and forth in negotiations with them. I'm asking if they go with the tech recommendation. If they're going with their recommendations, do you go back and forth with them? Is it a negotiation? Oh, yeah. So, oh, definitely. There's definitely a back and forth and a back and forth. And this could go on for weeks, months, or even years, depending upon how big a design is. Absolutely. Hence the reason architects need such expert communication skills and soft skills, because it's going to be an iterative process going on for a long period of time. Do I use the official TOGAF methodology? I definitely do not. Here's the thing. There's about a million and one theoretical frameworks out there, and they're all so far theoretical. There's nothing that I could even use to ever try and explain that to a customer. So I don't use TOGAF methodology at all. I can tell you at one point there was part of a team, and I like TOGAF, and I think it's a good architect certification. I can tell you that there were some architects in the company I worked for they used the TOGAF methodology, they designed an architecture, and they presented to customer after customer after customer after customer after customer. And after six months of presenting this architecture with the TOGAF methodology, not a single customer understood what they wanted. And then I was hired to design an architecture for this customer. And you know what I did? I designed it in plain and simple terms. I described what does what, which components of the network do what, which parts of the data center do what, what parts of the campus do this? How do you set up the remote access employees? How do you deal with the voice? How do you deal with the video? How do you deal with the wireless? It was plain. It was simple. It was prescriptive. It actually mentioned the actual things that we were actually using. And I'd say we're going to use a load balancer. The load balancer that we're going to choose is going to be a network load balancer from F5. It was Chris. The customer knew what to do. I was promoted three times in about two years from doing on that document. I had to travel 300,000 miles a year just talking about that document and closing massive deals. And here's the thing. It was real. It was something the customer could put their hands on. It was tangible. So the key was give somebody something that's meaningful, and then they're going to want it. I have no problem with TOGAF. None. It's good architecture, sir. But it's not prescriptive. It's like the NIST framework. You look at the NIST framework, you can read it 50 times, and it's like, okay, where do I put my firewall? Where do I put my IDS? What kind of uh, social engineering training do I need to do to my store security staff? It's not there. You'll read what the world's best security minds in their lives put together, and none of that information is contained in there. So I stay away from things that are theoretical and academic. The theory of how things work is critical architecture knowledge. But, you know, all these little certification things, I don't spend a lot of time on that kind of thing. I focus on solving customer problems. Chris, if there's any others? No, you, you covered it. Okay. Okay, well, we'll talk a little bit about high availability system design. Maybe we'll whiteboard it out and... We'll give you guys some fun. We'll spend an hour with whiteboard stuff as necessary. I really want to make sure that we kind of, in some way, shape, or form, really give you guys some extra depth. Things that are outside of the traditional certification. Because like I said, certifications get you an interview, but they don't get you hired. It's this other stuff that gets you hired. So, high availability network design. So, availability 
means the service being ready for use when you want it. So designing for availability can become very costly. And going from four nines availability to five nines availability is a massive difference in cost. And we can help you with that. So massive, massive, massive difference in cost. So we're going to talk about availability as he beating 99%, 99.9%, 99.99%, which most people, not me, but most people would consider to be highly available, and 99.999%, which is what I've worked with for the last 20 years. Very small number of people can do it, but you can put together systems that are 99.999% available if you build the right team. And that's what I've been tasked with forever. So why? Is 99.99% good enough? It means that the systems will be available for everything other than basically 50 minutes per year, which means less than an hour is enough for most organizations. Now, I want you to think about it this way. If your internet service provider is down for an hour per year, well, if you're a home, it's expected, but if you're a business, it's not okay. If you're a hospital and your systems go down, someone can die. If you're a bank and you've just placed a trade for a million shares of the stock, and the stock price went down $10 and you can't sell it, it could be very expensive. So banking, healthcare, service provider, these organizations need real availability, meaning 99.999% availability, which means about five minutes of downtime per year. So keep that in mind. These are what those numbers look like metric wise. As you can see, 99%, not real good. 99.9% still. Nine hours of downtime per year. If you're lucky, that's what you're going to get from your home internet service. Three nines. Four nines, relatively highly available network. Five nines, five minutes and 15 seconds of downtime per year. Look at that. That's seriously high availability. So how do you build the high availability system? Well, no. I mean, no single points of failure. So I want you to think about what that looks like, what we've talked about over this last week. Redundant power. That means redundant transformers coming into the building. That means redundant uninter uninterruptible power supplies. It means redundant generators. It means redundant cabling. And it means redundant power distribution units. It means two sets of cooling air conditioners in there, not just one. It means networking connections need to be redundant. One is none, two is one, and three is greater than two. It means your routers should have multiple control modules, multiple power supplies, and they should be redundant redundant routers. It means you should have redundant switches and redundancy in your switches. It means your server should all have two power supplies and be designed for uptime. It means your load balancers should all be running and operationally full-time and be redundant. It means your DNS needs to be set up right. It means your storage needs to be redundant. And it means your applications need to be redundant. So here's the thing. One is none. Two is one. And three is greater than two. So build some redundancy in there. Now, I know I keep talking about this for this reason. I keep talking about these high availability routers because AWS will keep saying, our routers are highly available. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. They are highly available, but... The router that you can use to connect to the AWS router isn't. So you need two routers to connect to AWS, two, a minimum of two, because if the router fails on your end, it doesn't matter that the AWS end is high end. So two routers. So dual power supplies, dual control modules. And guess what? If you're going to use a link aggregation group, and I recommend you do, bundle multiple direct connections together in a high performance thing. Make sure they're not on the same line card in the router. So that way, if you've got four links, ideally they're on four cards. If two cards fail, you've still got two large cards linked. So really, really, really. And the last thing is make sure that you're running stable firmware. When I log into my firewall, I see this. This little thing on the bottom. This is the biggest joke. I see this on my firewall when I log into my firewall. Your security appliance is running stable firmware. To try some of the new features we've been developing, L4 through 7 SD-WAN device monitoring, many not over auto VPN, please check to upgrade to the latest beta. Who puts beta code on their devices? So the point is, is you got to look at what you're doing. Don't use beta code. So high availability, redundancy, and making sure that your things are there. 
So what else goes into building a high availability system? And why is it so much easier in many cases on the cloud? Why, why, why? AWS already has the redundant power. AWS has the redundant cooling. AWS has the redundant internet connections. They've got redundant routers, redundant switches. So all their stuff is already done for you. So with AWS, they've done two thirds of the work. So it becomes a lot easier. So let's talk about building high availability, high performance on the cloud. Best practice, multiple availability zones, minimum, minimum. Two availability zones gets you to 99.99% available, which means four nines, which means 50, basically 52 minutes. I think it's 52 minutes of downtime per year or 50 minutes. Reasonable. Anything that needs to be high availability should be in two availability zones. That means your compute instances or virtual machines, your databases, your load balancers, all of it should be in multiple ACs because you want it to work. Now, if you need 99.999% five nines, you have two options. Option one, I don't recommend multi-AZ and multi-region. That gets you to 99.99% available on the AWS cloud. Why don't I recommend that? Well, I'm a fan of building redundancy. AWS is incredible. AWS architects are incredible. Their engineers that build their systems are incredible, but everybody has outages. And if you go multi-region, multi-AZ, and AWS has an outage, you're still out regardless of how good your systems are. So I personally, if I needed five nines, would do two AZs on AWS and two availability zones on either Azure or Google or Oracle. And that way, I've got two clouds that are each 99.99 together, I've got five nines and I've got redundancy amongst cloud providers, redundancy amongst internet providers, redundancy everywhere. So personally, if I need more than four nines availability, I'm using multi clouds and two availability zones per cloud. That's me because I don't look um, what's the simplest. I look at what gives my customer the best long-term options. So there's that. Now, what else? When we're dealing, we want redundant network connections. So. For most clients, it's going to be a direct connection on a VPN, but not everybody. So some people will have a primary direct connection and need a backup direct connection. Other people can get away, like and some people will have a four 10 gig links in a link aggregation group. If you've got four gigs, four 10 gig links or 40 gigs as your primary link in the link aggregation group, chances are you're not going to get away with a one gig or a 10 gig VPN backup. If you need 40 gigs of direct connection to work, a one gig VPN isn't gonna work. You might need a redundant link aggregation group. So kind of keep these in mind. Now, when you're getting your network connections, don't get them on the same service provider. Two connections on AT&T is crazy because if AT&T has a problem, you're down on both. A connection through AT&T and a connection through Verizon or NTT or CenturyLink, I don't care. Pick two service providers to connect you. You're sensing something, huh? Two data centers, two cloud providers, two service providers, two routers, two of everything. So, you know, sometimes when people are like, Mike, do you not like the cloud? Is that why you want two clouds? No, I love the cloud. That's why I want two clouds. I want to know that it's going to work. Everybody has outages. Azure got hacked last month pretty badly. Their databases, their customers got attacked. It wasn't good. And Azure's great. They're smart. They've got an incredible number of smart, talented people. Facebook had a massive outage. People have outages. It's just going to happen. Look how many times LinkedIn goes down, and it's great. LinkedIn goes down. Facebook went down. Instagram went down. WhatsApp went down. The reason I'm saying these are the best network operators in the world, and they still go down, and they're the best. Everybody else will go down, too. So plan around it and have redundancy, multiple cloud providers. Now, security. If your systems get hacked, your systems are not available. So when you're building a high availability, high performance environment, you need security. So let's talk about that. Principle of least privilege. We talked about that. The need to know. Don't give people access to more than they need to know. We talked about on your servers, making them secure. We talked about patching the servers. We talked about disabling unnecessary services. 
For example, like when we talked about a server for a Linux server doesn't need a graphical interface. Shut every unnecessary service down. Use AWS organization so that you can limit it so that if something happens in this part of the organization, it doesn't have to affect this part of the organization. Limit the blast radius. Keep unwanted traffic out of your subnets with network access control lists. Keep unwanted traffic out of your servers with security groups. Use a firewall, an IDS IPS system. Use some DDoS protection. Get good physical security to devices that are connecting to the clouds. And the level of security you need is going to be based upon what you have to secure. If and when you have to use passwords, use strong passwords. When you can use something stronger, use it. If you've got good configurations, template them. Template them with a thing like a confirmation template or better yet, Terraform. Template stuff that's good. So you can do it right, right, and more right. Back up. One of the biggest issues organizations have is data loss. Back up. Consistent backup strategies protect against data loss. Your backup should be stored in at least one secure location. I back up. I've got a set of backup drives. And I have an off-site backup, and I have a third cloud backup. I have backups to my backups. You should too. Create images of the production servers, and that way when a server goes down, you get another one. Backup and store your router and firewall configurations. High availability, high performance. Now let's talk about ways we can do more. Auto scaling. Whoa, auto scaling is the greatest. Auto scaling can help us auto scale out of a DDoS attack. If for some reason we got a lot of traffic patterns, which could accidentally just DDoS our own thing, just because it's more than our servers can handle, auto scaling can let our systems grow and be self healing. Decouple our applications whenever, ever possible. So use queuing, use anything we can to decouple our applications. And in the process of doing something, we're going to boost our application performance. Use caching to offload our servers. Use redundancy in the DNS. Use load balances that remove single points of failure by enabling us to use 10 small servers instead of one big so we cannot eliminate single points of failure. So realistically speaking, this is what we're trying to talk about. Log your system. Look at the logs. Monitor for system alerts. Constantly check out their search for security breaches. Look for usage and monitor for performance. These realistically are the things that we're talking about. Now, the last component of these high availability systems is change management. In fact, when I interview people, I ask them what goes into five nines. And almost no one knows to mention change management, which means I know they read a book, but they've never worked in tech. Anybody that's worked in tech knows that change management is one of the most critical components of delivering a five nines available network, meaning something that's gonna be available when you need it all but five minutes and 15 seconds of downtime per year. This means that if you're gonna make a change, you ask everyone ahead of time. You make sure that your change won't affect anything anybody else is doing. Everybody agrees on the change. Everybody agrees on the time on the change. Everybody, and after you make your change, everybody that matters checks their systems to make sure there's nothing wrong. And if there is, you all work together to fix them. So this is how you build a high availability, high performance system on the cloud or off the cloud. It's really the same thing. Or in a hybrid cloud or in a multi-cloud environment. So let's do this. So let's see if we've got some questions. And after that, maybe I'll whiteboard something with the group. Question, will AWS Outpost be considered as a hybrid cloud enabler? I want to make sure AWS Outpost is the service that I think it is because Azure's got one that's just like it. So Aqua, very interesting. The AWS Outpost is very similar to a, what do you call it? An Azure functionality that enables you to run some things on their infrastructure as well as your infrastructure. And the concept of enabling people to run some of these workloads in their data center and the cloud providers is there. Now, here's what I'm gonna say. Now, first, you've got the OpenStack Cloud and the Nutanix Cloud. And when I look at what Azure is trying to do with their edge computing and pushing it into the data center, and I see that with AWS Outpost, it looks like the, event, the cloud providers are starting to say, wait a second, we have to compete 
with the Nutanix and the OpenStack solution. The Nutanix and the OpenStack solution allow the organizations to leverage their data centers and work and use the servers that they already paid for to handle their compute loads in a seamless environment. So because of this, because there's these great companies that are giving organizations the ability to do it, the cloud providers like AWS and the cloud providers like Azure have to give the users to do it. So Aqua, I think what's going on is the hybrid clouds are becoming so much more important that the cloud providers are saying, we can't afford to lose it to OpenStack and we can't afford to lose it to Nutanix. So we're gonna go out there and we're gonna let you do some of it yourself with our stuff. And it's gonna look and feel like AWS on your own environment. And because of that, you're gonna be excited and call it all cloud computing. So yes, Aqua, I think it's exactly what's going on. And to me, that is another hybrid cloud enabler. It's actually them trying to basically say, we realize that the hybrid clouds exist. We realize it's not all coming to us. We realize we're not a single vendor solution. So here, we're gonna work with you and give you some of what you need so you don't have to go to OpenStack or Nutanix to do it. That's the way I see it. And I think, by the way, it's a very good thing. I am very excited to see these kind of outposts and these Ada and these Azure environments where they're letting organizations do the computing in their data center or on the cloud. Pay for the workloads in the cloud, not the data center. It's going to make things seamless. And I think if the cloud providers do it so beautifully and so elegantly, they actually have the potential to take out the hybrid cloud people because then I think they're now orchestrating it very nicely. So I think it's a great thing, Aqua. You're exactly right. Um, Aqua, you're always on the bleeding edge of knowing where these trends are coming from. And I think that's comes from your good networking background. So absolutely, Aqua. David Page. If you're using two routers to AWS, would you use two different router vendors? No. Um, I'm going to pick the best router vendor. I don't need two router vendors. And the reason is routers don't go down like a vendor would. So somebody else's network would go down. So if I've got a phone line from AT&T, the reason it's going to go down is somebody is going to dig in the ground and cut a cut fiber off the connection, or somebody's going to make an error on a switch. A router or an inanimate object that sits there that's going to work isn't going to just break um, just because of it. So no, I wouldn't do that because if you do, you're going to run into more problems related to vendor interoperability than you actually would get from benefits. But I'd make sure my two links are up of different service providers every step of the way. Chris, you want to bring in the next one? They have a page. If you're going to have four 10 gig links, direct connections in a loop aggregation group, do they all have to be from the same vendor? Yes, you should have to. So David, what you're going to do when you create a link aggregation group is you should have four from say AT&T in one link aggregation group and your backup should be say four from Verizon. When you're dealing with a link aggregation group, you're dealing with bundling four links or two links or three links together. And in the process, these links must be equivalent latency. And any variations in the latency between your links can be kind of ugly. So realistically speaking, you should have one link aggregation group with just one set of service provider links and another one with another set of service provider links. So realistically speaking, two sets of link aggregation groups a primary and a backup. Because if you need 40 gigs primary, you need 40 gigs backup. So I recommend you do two with different people. So that's exactly how I would suggest it. So I know I don't see any other questions here, but I wanna make sure that uh, we get there. So there's one question that I don't think we actually answered. And uh, I do wanna answer it and it's related to the TOGAF question. It's from old time, Oh no, um, never mind. I, I thought uh, it's from Tom Orthe Ortheus, where it says, so don't spend time on TOGAF. Chris, do you see that? <coughs> yeah, you ended the last question and answer session on TOGAF. Oh, okay, didn't realize that. So but you can I, cover it again since you brought it up. So I think the previous person asked if I used TOGAF, and I said no, and for the reasons why I didn't. And then this was the question which came right up after that, which was from Tom, which was, so don't spend time on TOGAF certs. Tom, I wanna make it really clear. <clears throat> Certifications don't get anybody hired. Certifications do make a resume look better and certifications can get someone an interview. So I don't have the problem with the TOGAF per se. 
The issue, Tom, is what's going to be in your best interest? What's going to be the best thing to build your long-term career? And if you're an architect, it's probably not TOGA. So here's the thing. The architects and we engineers are different. We architects are about business transformation. And while the TOGAF is a nice little certification, and maybe the TOGAF bumps up your salary about $10,000 a year, and it probably will, that's all it's going to do. So, Tom, I'm about, you know, hitting the things that matter. You know, put 80% of your efforts into the things that deliver the maximum result and only leave 20% of your time for the things that leave minimal results. 80, that most people spend their time on certification. And I'm going to make this really clear. Certification, the statistics are really clear, has on average the potential to raise your salary by about $10,000 a year. Now, the rest of it is where the levers are. So when we're talking about building careers, Tom, when we talk about soft skills training, we're typically talking about a 33% boost in someone's salary. And when we talk about emotional intelligence training, we're typically dealing with about a $30,000 difference in someone's salary. So while you could spend the next six months of your life working on a TOGAF certification to raise your salary by 10000 and make your resume look a little better, if that same person would focus heavily those same six months on soft skills and their emotional intelligence, they can, realistically speaking, raise their salary on average about $80,000 a year every year for the rest of their life, which is an additional $2.4 million over a 30-year career. So, Tom... When I'm dealing with careers and I'm focusing on careers, I want to make sure that we have rock solid technical competency because without rock solid technical competency, we've got nothing. And then once we've got that technical competency, get out of the tech, focus on the business acumen, focus on the leadership, focus on the soft skills, the emotional intelligence, focus on business acumen, focus on industry expertise, focus on something that makes you so good and so valuable to the organization that they can't live without you, that they'll literally be willing to do or pay anything to have you on your team. It's not that I have any issue against the TOGAF cert. It's just that I like to spend my time where it's going to have the best return on its investment. And TOGAF just unfortunately just is not there. So that's the reason why. Old Time Honey Official, one of the companies you work for wanted to use Azure. They said it was the FinTech standard. Do I run into this when trying to plan an architecture for certain organizations? I run into lots of reasons organizations don't want to use a certain cloud provider. And it happens all the time. I run into organizations that won't use a specific cloud provider because of this cloud provider kicked the company out of their data center because they didn't agree with their mission. And I deal with 20% of the customers that say, I don't want to use that cloud provider. And I'm like, but they're a great cloud provider. And they're like, I don't want to use it for this reason. Don't put me there. I'm like, okay. I have other people that say, I want to go to this one, and it has to be this one because my brother works there. Okay. So really the key for me is I know lots of fintech companies that work on AWS. I know lots of fintech companies that are on Google, and I know lots of fintech companies that are on Azure. I, When I design my systems, I design what's best for them, and it usually involves two of these really great clouds. One of them is usually AWS because of their ubiquity. And another one is going to typically be either Azure or Google or somebody else because I want a backup of the second cloud. So I don't really have that problem. I start with the customer. I evaluate the customer's business. And by the time I'm done evaluating the customer's business, the people are far more concerned in my solution. And they don't really care whether it's AWS or Azure or anybody else. They care with what is the solution. So. I don't run into these stumbling blocks, but then again, I have to be fair. I don't really play the role of the technical architect. I'm an enterprise architect. I start with the executives. I start with the business. I only address business issues. And the, my vehicle to fix the business issues is tech. The tech is not, the tech is my tool. It's not my goal. Shakir. Most of the time, the customer is going to come with a budget and request for high availability and performance. And how are we going to give the design with less customers, with less components? You, you're, you're not. Um, you know, you've got availability and you've got a certain level of things to do availability. If you're running into these real major cost issues, it's because the architect isn't doing a good job. The architect is not quantifying the problem properly. If you don't quantify the problem properly, 
you can't sell the value of your solution. If an organization has got a billion dollar problem and solving that problem generates a billion dollars, then $30 million is real cheap to do it. Having said that, if you can't show that you can solve that problem, $50 might be more than the customer's willing to spend. So it's up to you to quantify the problem. It's up to you to show the solution to the problem. It's up to you to be able to do the ROI modeling and show financially how the expected value of your solution will be much greater than the cost. Only then is it something the customer will buy. You know, if you sell something for $1,000 and the $1,000 doesn't give your customer any value, it's really expensive. If you sell something for $10 and it provides no value for your customer, it's really expensive. If you sell something for a million dollars, but the customer gets $3 million interest, then it was cheap. The customer got paid to buy it. So Shakir, be the person that solves the customer's problem. Don't be the person that sells them the tech. The tech solves the problem. The tech sells itself. You solve the problem. That's where the budget comes from. Otherwise, you're going to be chasing your tail constantly dealing with money, money, and more money. So does anybody want to design a high availability cloud right now? Map it out, maybe one or two clouds, a data center, some high performance you guys want to do it. If you want to build a high availability cloud solution, type high availability cloud solution in the chat box, and I'll do one with you in real time. Otherwise, you know, it's up to you. Try to give you guys a little bit of flexibility. These are the main points that I wanted to cover for today um, we've, with regards to the content. But if you guys want to do some high availability cloud solutions, I see one from Pierre Lincoln. Let me know if I see enough high availability cloud solutions. We'll spend an hour and we'll architect a nice high availability. I see Shapur. Um, I see Shafiq. I see Pierre. I see Marla. I see... Uh, um, Kristen, Christian Rao. So, okay, maybe. I didn't see enough people. There's 80 people on this call. Somebody give me some likes. Somebody, uh, if you're not there, you know, hit the hit the subscribe button, tell others, and then let's go do some high availability system design. Okay, I'm starting to see some people, so I'm starting to get the feeling that you guys are awake, alert, and oriented. So let's do some high availability cloud solutions. Okay, let's map it out. Okay, we have Mike's nice, fancy, fancy, fancy whiteboard and my great artistic drawing capabilities, which involves squares, triangles, and blue and white colors and arrows and lines. So let's do some fancy artwork over here, everybody. High availability. So let's look at some high performance cloud computing networking. So let's say we have a website and we want this website to be super high availability and we need super high security. And let's say we're building a website that has to handle 50,000 web requests per second. So we're gonna need some robustness. Let's say we decided to go to the cloud and on this cloud, we wanna make sure that we know that it's gonna work. So all of you guys, you're gonna to have to help me. I am a CEO. I know absolutely zero about technology. My name is Mike, the CEO. I no longer, I'm a solution architect. I am not a cloud architect. I am not an enterprise architect. I am just Mike, the CEO. So I'm non-technical. So we're gonna to together do a high availability architecture. You guys are gonna to have to help me. You guys are gonna to have to Google. You guys are gonna to have to think and it's gonna be fun. So let's go do it. Let's say we're example, we're designing. I'm gonna tell you that right now I have been funded. I was lucky enough and I reached out to a multi multi-billionaire friend and my multi-billionaire friend says to me, Mike, I need you to build one of the best e-commerce sites in the world that's going to specialize in selling cat toys. And I said, why cat toys? And they said, because your cat Cindy is a celebrity. Everybody knows him and you want to sell cat toys. And I'm like, okay, cat toys it is. And they told us that the way they want us to sell cat toys is to develop a website 
And on this website, we're going to have the most dynamic content, engaging content, and videos of cats. So we're going to have static content and dynamic content. And it's going to drive everybody to our site, and it's going to be global. And apparently, if we build this right, people are going to be buying cats, according to, the, to our sponsors. They're going to be buying cat toys 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're going to be buying food and toys. And it's expected that we're going to do $100 billion a year on our first year because we've been given a $10, million, a $10 billion advertising budget by our super rich benefactor that wants us to sell cat toys. Why cat toys? I don't know. Well, I could think of right now. My cat Cindy's being energetic today. So here's what we're going to do. Now, we know right now with what I've told you that we're going to have an incredible amount of hits. What did we say? 50,000 hits per second. We expect a lot of letters. So let's see what we need. We're going to need high availability connections to the cloud, right? So let's say we're sitting here and let's say we've got our on-premise environment. Everybody, we are here. I need you to guide me. So we have an environment we expect a hundred billion dollars a year of sale of cat toys. Does this look like something we're going to build a brand new data center or maybe we should go to the cloud? Do you think we've got a scalability problem here, everybody? Do we need high performance? Should this go cloud or should this go data center? Tell me in the chat box. Aqua's first question is accurate. Excellent. We cannot tolerate more than five minutes of downtime per year. Thank you, Aqua. And we cannot be hacked, Aqua. If we get hacked, we are out of business. So, Pierre Lincoln, you're saying cloud because of the scalability. Is that the reason? Kenya Carl, cloud due to scalability. I like that. Derek Houston, cloud due to scalability. Marla, Jeannie, cloud. Yes, this looks like we should go to the cloud. Well, Marek, we're going to need a lot of load balancers here, like a lot, a lot of load balancers. But yeah, we're going to go to the cloud. So, we're going to go to the cloud. So, now, five nines availability. So now, five nines availability. Do I stick all our eggs in the AWS basket, or do we do half AWS and half Azure and work around any kind of concerns? What would you guys suggest? Five nines availability. We can't handle more than five minutes and 15 seconds of downtime per year, and we expect Alex Wood, excellent, two cloud providers. So we'll map out the whole thing. We need scalability, and we need to know that we're available. So let's do this. Let's set up AWS because it's a great cloud. And let's set up Azure because it's another great cloud. Now, let's make sure we really do this right. Okay, so now we're on two clouds. We're going to put half and half. Marla, excellent. Half and half. Great job, Marla. So now, what kind of connections do you think we should have to these clouds? Remember, $100 billion a year of cat toys we're going to sell. What kind of, what kind of connections? Are we going to be using VPN connections here? Or are we going to be using high-performance, high-availability connections? Because we want everything to work. Derek, every day you impress me. So, can you Carl, direct connection? Yeah, I'm going to use direct connection. So, we probably, if we're dealing with 50,000 web orders per second, probably are going to need more than 10 gigs. We're definitely not going to be using a VPN here. We're dealing with high performance, Huge connections, so we need private lines. So we're going to buy a private line. Azure calls it Express Route. AWS calls it a direct connection. So we are going to need multiple routers across multiple service providers. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to get two routers to AWS, and we're going to connect to two HA routers at AWS, we're going to do a primary and a backup direct connection because cost doesn't matter and we need it to work. We're going to have two more of these little routers. And we're going to do a primary and a backup direct connection location. $100 billion a year. I don't care about a couple thousand dollars extra per month. 
It is irrelevant for me. Um, Alibaba is a great cloud. When you're dealing with stuff in China, there's the great firewall at China and there's lots of complexities dealing with China. Unless I did a lot of business with China, I would keep it to AWS, Azure, Google, Dell, Palo Alto, or Cisco Clouds for right now. Not that I have any aversion to Alibaba. They are an incredible company, but you know, for simplicity purposes, I try to use the, the local clouds that we're dealing with. Now, right now, we've got direct connections to AWS and uh, Azure. We're pretty solid, but personally, I would create some connectivity between Azure and AWS. And here's why I would do this. By doing it this way, if we lose at both of these routers, we can still reach AWS through Azure. If we lose the connections to Azure, we can still get to the connections between AWS. And this kind of puts us out of dealing with low performance VPN connect connections in between things. And quite frankly, what we probably would have in many of these cases is most likely a couple of link aggregation groups. Because if we're gonna deal with an environment like this, we're probably gonna have redundancy on both links. And we might need four 10 gig links. I mean, this is relatively high performance networking to deal with something like this. So that kind of is what each one of these environments is gonna look like. Now let's, let's architecturally look at what the web app would look like. And we're gonna design one, and then we're gonna do the same thing for Azure. Guess what? Because I'm not a tech professional, I'm just a CEO, you guys are gonna to have to tell me the tech. So let's go create our application, and we're only gonna show it in the concept of one availability zone because it's gonna be the same in both. But I want you guys to map it out. We're gonna have some fun over here. So actually, let's not even do it, let's just map it out. So we need to connect to the internet. For our web servers. Does anybody remember what that device is that connects to the internet with regards to AWS? What's it called? We talked about it on day one. There's a device that it's a router that connects to the internet. Does anybody remember what that device is called? Somebody help me by typing it in the chat box. It's called an internet gateway. Great job. An internet gateway connects us is a router that connects us to the internet. So behind the internet gateway, we'll have a firewall, which we'll put somewhere else. And yes, Aqua, Aviatrix will happily connect. Excellent job, AWS and, and Azure. Totally, 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 um, exactly. So we've got an internet gateway that's connected to the internet. And behind the internet gateway, well, after our firewalls, there's gonna be the device. Now, what if I wanna have more than one one uh, web server. What's that device I use? If I want to use more than one web server, what's that device called? There's a technology that enables me to load share um, across multiple internet, uh, multiple devices. That's right, Amaranth. Good job, Amaranth and Genie. We need a load balancer to load balance across these things. So now we've got a website, everybody. The website itself has to deal with 50,000 requests per second. 50,000 web requests per second. So does that look like an application load balancer that's intelligent and slow or a network load balancer that's fast? We need a network load balancer because we need the speed. Exactly, Derek. We need speed. Otherwise, we'd use an ALB. So we've got a network load balancer. Now, what's a virtual machine called an AWS that we would use to put our web server on? What's AWS called?
Excellent. AWS calls their virtual machines EC2 instances, old time. Honey Official and Amarath and Genie, good job. So we're going to have our EC2 instances. Okay, good. So EC2 instances. Let's say we've got 50 application servers or 5,000 application servers, not just one. We're going to need a device to load share across the application servers. What do you think that device that load, we need to load balance across application servers is going to be called? Somebody help me here with the load. How we're somebody help me here with what we need to use, uh, Derek? Exactly. We're going to need another load balancer, network load balancer, application load balancer. Depending upon the speed and performance, we're going to need a load balancer. So let's say. We're going to use another network load balancer because we still need the performance. The point is, is we need a load balancer, whether it's an application load balancer or a network load balancer. Application load balancer, if we need the intelligence. Network load balancer, if we need the performance. We've got a website that's handling 50,000 requests per second. We're not getting away with an application load balancer. We need a network load balancer. We need performance. If we were getting 1,000 web requests per minute, we use an application load balancer. So now we know what we need, but we still know we need a load balancer. Now, we're going to need a database. We need a database that's going to scale and be capable of handling a huge number of transactions. Huge number of transactions, plenty of read, plenty of write, and we're going to be on two clouds. So. Somebody give me one of two, one, one, uh, the kind of database that we can use that will enable us to have unlimited scalability and then flexibility in our schema. What kind of a database could we use considering we want to use two? Okay, no SQL is good. Cassandra is good. Yes, Cassandra is good. Any other opportunities? Um, we can't use DynamoDB or Cosmos because we won't be able to work with across multiple cloud providers. We obviously aren't going to use a C SQL database because we need a lot of performance. So when we need something that gives us flexibility of schema and extreme performance and unlimited scalability, we have to use a NoSQL database, which means, realistically speaking, MongoDB or Apache Cassandra. These are one of those places that we're going to come from. So we can't use things like Aurora. We can't use things like DynamoDB or Cosmos. We have to use things that are standards. And then we can work across cloud providers. It has to be that way. That's why we wouldn't use my Well, my SQL would work, Alex, but it's not going to scale to our needs. We need a no SQL database. But otherwise, that would be good. So let's say we have, we let's say MongoDB. Derek, Oracle is a fantastic uh, SQL database, but we probably need to know SQL database for something like this. So this is what we're going to do at AWS. Now, if we go to Azure, remember, I'm not a tech professional. With Azure, we don't have an internet gateway. We put our stuff in the public subnet. So let's just call it the public subnet. So. There's our Azure architect. Azure still needs the internet. They don't use the, with Azure, we basically use the public subnet. Now, do we need, do we need a load balancer with uh, Azure? And if so, is it gonna be the same network load balancer that we need with AWS? Does anything change with the load balancer architecture? Is it the same on Azure um, as AWS? Everyone? Shafiq, yes. It's going to be the same. So everybody, now here's what I want you guys to do. So we can say that we've been solution architects for the day and not just cloud architects. Let's come up with the solution architect piece. We'll come up with the name. Okay. AWS calls this an internet gateway. AWS calls their network load balancer an elastic load balancer. AWS calls their virtual machines an EC2 instance. AWS calls this an elastic load balancer.
MongoDB, where are you putting it? You're putting it on an EC2 instance. Okay, now with uh, AWS, we've got the, I'm sorry, Azure, we've got the public subnet. What does Azure call their load balancer? Oh, wait, they call it an Azure load balancer. What do they call their EC2 instances? They call them a virtual machine. I have our app servers in here somewhere. So let's call this an Azure load balancer instead of an NLB because it's got, we'll call it an Azure load balancer. Now, they don't call it an EC2 instance. They call it a virtual machine. And we're going to put the MongoDB on a virtual machine. Now we're on two clouds. Okay, so this is why when I tell people, when they say, which cloud I should I learn? I say, don't learn any cloud, learn the cloud. Notice what we did first. The architecture that we came up with, we talked about the modules, the load balancers, the virtual machines, the load balancers, the virtual machines, the databases. It doesn't matter when we build our architecture this way. Guess what? We'll go to Google. We can call it, if it was Google, it would be a cloud load balancer. It would be a compute engine instance, a cloud load balancer, a compute engine instance. We'd install the same MongoDB on a compute engine instance. And guess what? If we went to the Oracle cloud, we'd do the same. If we went to the Cisco cloud, we'd do the same. If we went to the Dell cloud, we'd do the same. The Nutanix cloud, the OpenStack, it's the same. We're just changing the game. It's like the rolling, it's like the rolling, no, the, the Who song, Meet the New Boss. Same as the old bus. We won't get fooled again. Don't believe the cloud provider marketing speak. It's all the same. It's a virtual network and a virtual data center. So the next component, Aqua. Aqua, this is why I know you've been, you're such a great architect. He's already bringing it about. The system can't get hacked. So Aqua, what do we need to do? How do we lock these systems down? Because now we've done the network piece, but we have not done the security piece. So we want to speed our content around the world as fast as possible so that everybody gets access to Cindy, for Cindy's photos, Cindy's videos, and cat toys, and cat food, and cat treats, because we want the cat-loving community to be coming to this website. Sorry, my cat was really, uh, she slept on my feet last night and woke me up licking this morning, so I'm in a cat mood. So anyway, so we're now dealing with the cats and we're having fun and we're building these great cat toys and cat toys environments. So Derek Houston, we're gonna put DDoS on, great, on the content delivery network, excellent. So Derek, we will have a CDN. I love that, Derek, we're gonna put a CDN there. And you said you're gonna put some DDoS protection on the CDN. DDoS, excellent job there. Now, um, I see the DDoS and the CDN, but I don't see anything related to how to secure this yet. So I'm gonna use so something to keep, uh, oh wait, to keep bad guys out. I see Perez the dev has got a good answer there. I see Shafiq is actually in the right direction. So the question becomes is, is this mission critical security or is it basic security? If it was basic security, I would use AWS WAF. If this is mission critical security, I am going to get a serious security appliance. I am going to get it from the marketplace. So I am going to get a firewall. Now, what kind of availability did we talk about? Five nines. So if I get a firewall from the marketplace, where does everybody tell me in marketplace firewall? Where does the marketplace firewall sit on? Is it do we go in there and we rack it, or did the marketplace firewall sit on the virtual machine? Somebody let me know in the chat box. Remember, you guys are the cloud architects. I'm just the CEO because this is really important. Old time honey official. Peter Lincoln, Tom, who's got a name that might be Greek like mine. Um, Derek Houston, it resides on a mission of Perez. Is mission critical means we've got to use something strong, but it's on a virtual machine. 
is a virtual machine a high availability device, everybody? Or can a virtual machine crash? The virtual machine is not a high availability device. It can crash. A firewall that you get from the store that you rack that runs a heartbeat back in between between the firewalls and they say firewall, firewall, firewall. They can do that, but the virtual machines can crash, which means we need to use more than one virtual firewall. We need to use more than one virtual computer. How do we use more than one virtual computer? What do we need to do if we need to use more than one server? What that magic device that we could use? That magic device that improves performance and availability by helping us load share across various computers. We use a load balancer. Kenya Carl, exactly. We're gonna use a network load balancer. We need a load balancer for this. So now what we need to do because our VMs can crash is we need a load balancer. So let's think about what our options are. Let's say we've got firewall. Remember, this is not our data center. We're not going by in the Cisco router screwing it in. Love the Cisco device, but we can't do it. So we need two firewalls. And what are we going to use? We're going to use a load balancer of some kind. We need a high throughput, high performance load balancer. So we have two options. We can use what everybody's used for the last couple of decades, which is basic, or the last period of time, which is a network load balancer. Um, but what the AWS also has, they have the, this concept of a gateway load balancer, which is really like a network load balancer that's designed to load balance between firewalls and routers. I'm going to call it a network load balancer. AWS doesn't have a lot of information about their gateway load balancers. They don't talk about their performance. They don't talk about their specs. Can't even tell if it's anything different than a network load balancer with anything other than a different name. But we can use a gateway load balancer for it. It's a great option. We can use a network load balancer. I'm just going to use the network load balancer here because it's what I've done in a lot more environments and it's where my comfort zone exists. But they're both good options. So now that we've got our firewall, ideally, this is a next generation firewall, but let's just pretend it isn't for right now. So if, if it's not, we're going to use an intrusion detection, intrusion prevention system. In fact, Aquos. Answer that you just put there, the F5 load balancer from the marketplace is definitely an alternative. And guess what, everyone? When you need high features, high functionality load balancers, you know what you're going to do? You're going to get an F5 load balancer here, and you're going to get an F5 load balancer here, and you're going to use an AWS network load balancer to load balancer your F5 load balance, your F5 firewalls. So why do you do that? These uh, pretend these were these these load balancers. These were F5 load balancers instead of firewalls. Any virtual appliance that you get from the marketplace is on an EC2 instance, which is in high availability. So in the cloud, we use load balancers to load balance and our way out of limitations on the cloud. So there you go. CDN, network load balancers, firewalls, IDS, IPS. Now what? So let's look at it. Let's work through everybody. Okay, so the CDN doesn't let only forwards legitimate requests to the servers. And, and yes, Sash, Sam, great job. So the CDN blocks that. The DDoS protection stops even more. The low, well, Then we go to the firewalls, and, and that blocks everything. But if something passes, the firewalls have got the IB, IDS IPS system. Now we're going to protect the subnets with the network access controller. And after we use the network access control lists, we're going to protect our servers by using security groups. What are we going to do after the servers? we got to protect our servers, right? Well, what if we put another firewall on the servers, like a host-based firewall? Maybe we put some anti-malware protection here. Maybe we disable some unnecessary servers. Maybe we do some patch management. Okay, so that's what we're kind of trying to do over here to make it work. So now we're going to really lock down our servers. Then, is there, and let me second, I'm looking. Um, conceivably, Derek, I believe the answer to your question is the yes. 
that you can actually put a network load balancer in front of firewalls and spin up additional ones? I believe the answer is yes, but I've not done that, so I don't want to confirm that, but I think so. So now, when somebody knocks on the door and bypasses all these things, and they're on our systems, we need to determine who they are, what they're allowed to do, and then track it. What's that called? Peter Lincoln, um, actually, Peter Lincoln, great question. So, Peter Lincoln, if we were in the data center, um, we would do the same thing. We would still have a content delivery network. We would still use the firewall. We would still use an IDS. We would still use access control list, Peter Lincoln, and we'd still do the same thing on the servers in the data center, too. Okay, yeah, so determining who the users are and what they're allowed to do and paying a track to them is what's called identity and access management, also known as AAA, authentication, authorization, and accounting. So we're going to put our AAA here, or IAM. Now, are we going to be crazy and think we're going to go to the AWS Management Console and add every single user as a user or a group? Or are we going to do something like federate to Microsoft Active Directory? We're going to federate to an identity provider like Active Directory, like anybody else would. And what else should we do with our stored data? Should our stored data be out there for everybody to read? Or should our stored data be encrypted somewhere along the line? MitraPan, exactly. We're going to use Microsoft AD. We'd be crazy to try and do it otherwise. And probably, what else? I think maybe we should be looking at logs and audit trails. Okay, yeah, we're definitely going to use some encryption. Okay, so here's what I want us to do. We're going to now, because I my point is always, learn the cloud and not a cloud provider. We're all going to right now um, do what we need to. Nitro Pan, we can't do VLANs here, unfortunately. So, everybody, what is the A? Let's we're gonna we're gonna do two of these. We're gonna do one of these for AWS, and one of these for Azure. You guys are gonna have to help me. Remember, I'm not a tech professional. What does AWS call this content delivery network? Remember, I'm a CEO today, not a tech professional. What is the AWS content delivery network called? Somebody let me know in the chat box. And also, after that, tell me the name of the AWS DDoS protection service. So CloudFront is what we're using. Cloudflare, Sharik, is another very good one, um, but that is a different CDN. So we're going to use CloudFront. Derek Houston, exactly. CloudFront, and we're going to use Advanced Shield. Excellent job. So we're on AWS. What is AWS calling a call a network load balancer? They've got some funny marketing speak term for a, for a network load balancer. What's that thing called? They call it an elastic load balancer. Excellent. Okay, so now we're doing some marketing speak. Okay, for the firewalls, we know we're going to the marketplace. We want an IDS IPS system, everybody. Where are we going? We're going to the marketplace. Network ACL is called the network ACL. Security groups called the security group because we use the AWS terms initially. Okay, how do we connect to AW on AWS to Microsoft AD? What's that thing called that we use that connects us to AWS? I mean to AD, Microsoft AD? That Active Directory thing that causes a connection. Um, we do use a SAML 2.0 as the language that we use, but it's actually technically called AD Connector. Great job, David. Great job, uh, um, 
certified ethical, but we are using SAML or Security Association Markup Language 2.0 to do it. Okay, so I yeah, Aqua, that's a good point. We probably could try and use guard duty as, as sort of like IDS, IPS, but I'm going to try and get something from the marketplace. But yes, that does sort of function like an IDS, IPS system. It's a great point there, Aqua. Okay, so what is this logging, auditing kind of functionality in AWS called? Where you, uh, where, what is that auditing thing called? Where we look for an audit trail of what our of what our people have done. CloudWatch is logging. Cloud Trail is auditing. Excellent. Cloud Trail. So we're going to look at CloudWatch and Cloud Trail. Okay. Now, what do we have to do on AWS to enable to turn on AES? 256-bit encryption for our stored data. Single sign-on will definitely work, uh, Rao, as long as we're using Microsoft AD Connector. We have to enable something. The key management system. Excellent, Jeannie. Arif, David, Wilson. Excellent. Amrath, nice. Kenya, Carl, wonderful. So, fantastic. So, we're going to enable the key management system. Oh, wait. We're using two clouds, aren't we? So let's do the... Uh, okay, which, so let's... Now let's do the... Okay, well, it would have helped if I was actually on the same one. So let's go over to here. Uh, for this, Now we're going to do Azure. What Does anybody know what Azure calls as their content delivery network? It, and as, as well as somebody tell me the Azure Content Delivery Network and the Azure DDoS. Make sure we, we know the Azure, Azure CDN Network. They've got a really great name for it. It's going to be relatively easy to understand. Now that we're welding the Azure network. Okay, so Peer Lincoln, it's called the Azure Content Delivery Network. <laughs> exactly. So they call it Azure CDN. But Peer Lincoln, I actually think you're right. I think they call it Azure DDoS protection. Okay, so what does Azure call a load balancer? They're they're a little less on the marketing speak. The, with Azure, they're a little. You don't have to think too hard to figure out what their tech is. It's one of the reasons I love working with Azure. Help me out here. Remember, I'm the CEO. You guys are the architects. They call it an Azure load balancer. Exa excellent. Now with Azure, where are we going to the firewalls? We're going back to the marketplace. No different. Where are we getting our IDS IPS system? Back at the marketplace. Okay. What is the network ACL on Azure? There's Azure calling that. Network security group, but is there an Azure ACL? It's called an Azure network, <laughs> an Azure network access control list. And then after that, there is a network security group. 
We're going to do the same host based firewall, anti malware, sure. Now, what does, what is this, what is this Active Directory thing on Azure called? What do you think Azure would call Active Directory? They call it Azure AD. Do we have to do anything on Azure to get 256-bit uh, AES encryption, or is it just standard and native like it should be? How about the encryption piece, everybody? By the way, if you're here and you're having fun, if you can hit the like, if you can tell a friend, we like any help that we can possibly have on these algorithms. Native, great job, Tom. It's and great job, Derek. It's there, Genie. Exactly, Cloud Hired. Okay, so um, the only thing that's missing now is uh, Azure Logs. Somebody tell me what Azure Logs are called. Call it, what do they call them? Log analytics, right? There is a monitor logs as well. I believe Amrath is as well. So good. So, but that's really the key. The key is over here right now, what have we done? We've designed the tech. The tech changes. So I want everybody to know that, look, if this was Oracle, I mean, if this was Google, this would be a cloud load balancer and it would still be a marketplace solution. And it would be the Google variation of the network ACL and the security group. It would be the Google SAML 2.0 connection to the Microsoft AD. It's not gonna change anything. It's the same because the cloud is a network and a data center that's been virtualized. So if this was the data center, we're still gonna use a CDN like Akamai and we're still gonna use Akamai's data protection. We might still need to use a network load balancer to front end two Palo Alto firewalls or just we'll let the Palo Alto firewalls do their things. And we'll either use the next generation capability on the Palo Alto firewall or guess what? We'll get an IDS IPS system too. We'll put access control lists on our routers. We won't have the ability to do a security group at all in the cloud, but we can do layer two ACLs, 802.1x authentication, private VLANs. We can rate limit it on, on our things and we'll be able to do 10 times more security in the data center that we couldn't do to the cloud. We do these same things in the data center. We deal with the same Microsoft Active Directory we deal with the same encryption and we still are gonna deal with the same log analytics. It's just gonna be a different package. So all of this, all of this, 100% of this is the same if it's done in the network and the traditional data center. If it's done in the cloud provider, the location, the geography is 100% irrelevant. That's what I wanted you guys to really learn that the cloud doesn't matter if it's AWS, if it's Azure, if it's Nutanix, if it's, it doesn't matter what all really matters. And there's only one thing that matters is solving the customer problems. You solve the customer problems, you do the business piece of the customer problems, you create the technology solution. And then after you create the solution, only after you've designed the solution, do you even think about whether it's AWS services and Azure services, and you're gonna have your team evaluate the pricing on all and see which is cheaper. You'll have your team help you because this is not a one-man band. This is, in every shape of the form, a team sport. So connect your two clouds, connect your three clouds, and you get high availability. What are really the chances in your mind? Really seriously think about it. What are the chances of 
two availability zones in AWS really going down? Not much. What are the chances of two availability zones in Azure going down? Not much. And what are the chances that simultaneously you will have a catastrophic outage at Microsoft and Amazon all at the same time? Not very much. Now, the chances of having Azure go down or Amazon go down independently would be much greater than the chances of Azure and AWS simultaneously going down. So that's why multi-cloud. One is none, two is one, three is greater than two, and a single cloud is quite that, a single point of failure. So Pierre Lincoln, it looks like you've got a question. Do you want to bring up that question, uh, um, Chris, so I can actually read the question? So if you connect two clouds together, you get much higher availability. Absolutely, Pierre. So the question you asked is that, is, is what we find out from the CEO to know, okay, so let me summarize Pierre's question. Pierre's asking me, is what the company tells you what drives the solution? Absolutely. So there's the incorrect way and there's the correct way. My friend Andrea said, God gives us one mouth and two ears for a reason so we can listen twice as much as you speak. So here's the thing. We go to that executive or whoever that executive is, could be the CEO, could be somebody else. We ask them, what's going on in your business? What are your goals? Only when we know what they're trying to achieve can we even think about the technology. Now I've got to tell you, in my experience, I've seen engineers try to solve problems before they've even identified the problem. I can literally be, and, I, I, and, I, and in the last day, thousand interviews, I was I would literally give an interview extract. I would give a situation, and before people heard the situation, they already told me which services they were using. None could have been hired because none of them even were solving. None of them even identified the problem that we're trying to solve. So first is identify the problem. If you've correctly identified the problem, then there's the solution. So people say, Mike. Why are you so soft skills success? Why are you so executive communication skills success? Well, because if you don't define the problem correctly, your solution will break your customer. Great example, when I was growing up, yes, I'm admitting how old I am right now. When I was growing up, Coca-Cola was the market leader in soft drinks. They had an iconic brand known throughout the world. Pepsi, another soft drink maker, had a very different strategy. Pepsi's strategy went and hired the world's best athletes and the most competitive people in the world and turned them into their sales force. So meanwhile, Coca-Cola, who's the market leader, is doing their current thing, and Pepsi hires a bunch of hardworking, never-quit athletes. So here's what really happened. Pepsi people sold, 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 sold. And the Coke people kept doing their same thing and stopped selling, 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 selling. So here's what happened. Coke, who was like 90% and Pepsi, which was like 10, all of a sudden it was like 50% Pepsi, 50% Coke. So the Coke people and this decided, here's the problem. The problem is our, our soda is not sweet enough. So Coke changed the formula. They released their new formula and they called it New Coke to compete with Pepsi. Now, New Coke didn't sell at all. Coca-Cola's market share went from like 50% to like 30%, like overnight. And I don't know the exact numbers. Their market share sunk like a stone. Everybody stopped drinking Coca-Cola. The new, better, sweeter Coca-Cola people didn't like. So Coca-Cola brought the old Coke back, and then the old Coke became the new Coke. And that gave, gave Pepsi these really great sales reps, these aggressive people, even more fodder to go talk about Coca-Cola. And then Pepsi grew, and then Coca-Cola figured out the problem. Coca-Cola figured out it's not our product problem, it's a promotion problem. And then Coca-Cola solved the promotion problem, and they became the darling. They became the number one soft drink maker in the world again. But what's there it was solving the right problem, not the wrong problem. You can't get to the right problem without asking a lot of questions. So the proper problem identification is the reason you need so much soft skills. That's why the people that approach architecture careers purely from a technical perspective, they end up solving the wrong problems. And it doesn't matter how good they are technically, 
if you can't get to the problem, you can't design the solution. So hope I made that one clear. And that's why we're so sub sales obsessed. So there are other, are there other questions, Chris? Yes, they're on the screen. What about the storage option and the security around it? I don't know what you mean there with regards to storage options because their option, there's a tremendous amount of storage on the cloud and how you would secure that would be based upon what you're trying to secure. So is it just basic object storage, for example? Um, in which case you would uh, do something else or is it how do you secure the data for an enterprise which again would be way outside of the scope of this. I could turn it into a into an enterprise global security kind of boot camp, but you know, um, storage option. I don't know what you mean with regards to just storage option and, and answers. Perhaps if you make it clear, I can answer it. What connection would you use to both clouds? Either a direct connection or, or some VPNs. You'd want, you'd use one of the two. I would use direct connections definitely to connect to connect to the clouds. And better yet, direct connections from cloud to cloud. But you could actually, from cloud to cloud, probably get away with VPN connections. Might. Because both of the cloud providers are going to have some really, really good VPN, B, really good BGP peering. So if you're dealing with AWS, who's probably peered to everybody, and if you deal with Azure, who's peered to everybody, if you're going to do a VPN between them, the VPN might actually be in the same building meaning one of their points of presence. So your, your VPN connections between an Azure and an AWS would be pretty darn impressive in terms of performance. So I might try that. Marla, you had a real estate agent tell me he found the perfect house for you before even asking you what you wanted to live. Exactly. Marla, that's the perfect example. The sales rep that already has your product sold without even meeting you or knowing what you want. That's exactly the person we don't want to be. Alex, exactly. Understanding the customer first is the solution. The engineer might be given a, a, a stack of papers that looks like this. that has got requirements and it's here. You're the official smart person in the room. Go build this. The architect is not the official smart engineer that's got all these technical things. The architect is the person that's going to go gather those requirements, obtain those requirements, obtain those business challenges, translate those business challenges into technologies. It's a very different world. And the thinking needs to be different. What about an EDR and an SIM? So, Shafiq, this goes back to something that I always say, never use acronyms, because I have no idea what you're even talking about. EDR, you're talking about enhanced data rates. Um, I just don't know. So, Abbreviations, there's literally hundreds of these things that all say the same thing. So I actually don't know what you actually need. Pierre Lincoln, thanks, Mike. You feel like a qualified solution architect after the session. Pierre, that's my goal. Pierre, I know who you are. I've been working with you. I love working with you. Each day you impress me. Jeannie, uh, thanks so much, Mike and Chris, for everything. Jeannie, honestly, every time we interact, it's a, it, it's a better day than the day before. So thank you so much. Uh, Summit. Thank you, Mike and Chris, for, for a wonderful knowledge and cloud networking session. You're more than welcome. And thank you so much for participating. Marla, thanks so much again, Mike, for sharing your time and vast knowledge. Another very enjoyable session. Marla, I'm so grateful that you were here. I love being able to interact with you. It's been a really a great week for us. I know I love doing it. I know Chris loves doing it. And I know my cat Cindy comes in. Um, she doesn't like to be picked up, but you know, she likes sitting on my lap when we do these one-week sessions too. Well, she's not here right now. She's chasing lizards. Chris, any more? Alex Wood. Okay. Oh, thanks, Mike. Really good session. When can we do a CCNA? Well, you know, Alex, I, 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 I can shed some light on that one now. <laughs> I've got some team that's working on that. I've got a team that's working on that right now, Alex. I have yet to see what the slides actually look like. Um, Chris has, so I'm pretty excited. I think we can probably assume that we're likely going to have a CCNA coming soon, and we may have an Azure thing coming relatively soon too, because I've tasked one of my best people uh, to for, to produce some Azure content as well.
Marla, I'm so happy to hear that and you're welcome. And thank you so much for coming. Old time honey official. Thanks so much. You'll be our current or buying our course for sure. We look, love to work with you and look forward to it. David Page, this has been the best 12 hours you spent in a long time. Thank you so much, David. We work really hard to try and make this and we're thrilled. Siyun, now you're welcome. Thank you so much. Ayo, wow. Thanks, Mike. Ayo, I am super happy to have you here. I actually have uh, four students named Ayo, and I love the name Ayo, and I know where it comes from, obviously, as well. Um, it is super nice to have you here. Wilson, uh, Cloud hired, wonderful. You're more than welcome. Shafiq, uh, thank you both. You've never been into a session like this before. Thank you. We're going to produce many more sessions like this. Mike, am I planning on a next boot camp? The answer is yes, Tom. And Tom, if you understand now, um, that would be kind of cool as well. I'm not sure, but your last name looks like you might. So I'm thinking the next one is going to be within about 30 days. So we are going to have another free lively boot camp. Kenya Carl, you're learning more and more every day. That is really great. Um, Sam, uh, you're more than welcome. It was so nice to speak with you yesterday. Amaranth, it's always always a pleasure every time I see you. Uh, Christian Rao, um, you're more than welcome. Derek Houston, as always, Mike and Chris, great boot camp. Derek, you have come so far, so fast from when we first met. Um, I love when you're around, and uh, you always impress me. Arif Ali, uh, you're more than welcome. Uh, so thrilled you're here. Uh, Marla Cloud hired. Thank you. Aqua, we love seeing you every time. Just your presence around here is really great. Um, thank you for everything you do here. Thank you for helping my friend B and Jacob doing what you do. For those that don't know Aqua, he helps lead a group of people working together on getting AWS certified. It's a really great group, the We're Fun group. I periodically get involved when I can. Um, what a wonderful thing you do. Aqua, thank you for all you do to help others out there too. And Kerr, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciated having you here, Kerr. And Pierre Lincoln, yeah, time to start the labs. Yeah, labs are really great. Pierre Lincoln, it's time for you to be VPNing into our servers and building your cloud. Um, and I know you're gonna have a great time building that OpenStack cloud, and then you can tell us all about the cloud. Um, Sareth Kumar, thank you. Uh, quite useful session. I'm so happy to hear that. Ooh, oh, oh, that, that, sorry about that. <laughs> I enjoyed the session. Thank you for taking the time and making it interactive. Um, thank you for participating and thank you for noticing. We worked really hard to make this interactive. I said to Chris last night, I said, I've never had so much fun and I've never been so tired. I said, I feel like I've been running a marathon all week. And I've been trying to be here with, you know, you guys early in the morning, bringing in some special, amazing guests like Christine, bringing in people in the evenings, trying to do some bonus sessions. So thank you for noticing. We're trying real hard to give everybody the best experience we can. Caroline, um, always love seeing you around. I love your background too. It's a lot like Chris's and it's, I expect some pretty great things coming from that. Thank you so much, Leo. Evo, and I know that's not your real name, but I know you really well. Thank you so much. I'm always thrilled when you're here. Um, you always have the nicest messages and you always ask about my baby girl, Cindy, and I appreciate that more than you know. Plus we're from the same place where we pretty much speak naturally the same language. So that's always a great bonus. Thank you so much, Evo. Carlito Way, love that movie, by the way. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much. We are very dedicated and we are thrilled to be here. So thank you for noticing and thank you. We appreciate your noticing. Cloud Hired, thank you, for Mike and Chris. I can't wait for more. You know what? Out of curiosity, if you guys want to tell us certain YouTube videos or things that you're curious about while we have a bunch of you, we'll try and take note of it. I can't promise to make everyone, but if I can, and there's things that you're curious about, if you want to let me know, I'll do my best to at least mention it to my team so we can try and start thinking about getting them for you. I just want to give you guys everything you need to give you guys the best cloud computing careers or networking careers. And we'll make the next one lots of interact. We'll make it more interactive too.
Okay, well, you know, I want to make sure you guys have a really great weekend. So, if you've got any last questions, please let me know. Otherwise, honestly, this has been so much fun for me. Um, we will do a subnetting workshop. Um, thank you for reminding us. That is terrific. Um, I will make sure that we do that. If there's any other kind of workshops that you find that you might want, um, let us know. We'll, we'll, we'll consider them. So happy to hear that, uh, Mr. Tawari. Evo, thank you as always for beautiful words, great skills in class. See, she always has uh, the most wonderful things to say thank you. And Virginia, I, I see your name there. Um, we've cleared all your questions, wonderful. CCNA will be great. I think the CCNA is going to be coming somewhat very soon. Any sessions on Terraform? You know, it's very interesting. Um, as, of, as it stands right now, we've been exclusively focusing on architects. And architects don't use tools like Terraform. They're more DevOps and more cloud engineering tools. Now, having said that, um, Sarath, I've tasked a very good friend who's a very good cloud architect with also very solid cloud engineering skills. And I tasked him with coming up with our cloud engineering program. And when we do our cloud engineering program, cloud engineers use Terraform. So we will have some content on Terraform and we'll most likely have something related to the Terraform world because now that we're branching out of just architects into engineering, um, we're going to be dealing with it a lot more. So I think you can assume that something will be coming. It's just a matter of when. Okay, everyone, I want to thank you so much. I want you to have a wonderful weekend. And yeah, there will always be more networking, Evo. And the reason we have to do more networking is the cloud's foundation is the network. Without a network, nothing is going to work. And realistically speaking, the people that are easiest to get hired are those that have the most networking. So will you hear more networking things coming from us? Yes. Did I just hire my CCIE lab partner who's working at a, who was working at AWS and he might be joining us in about six weeks to uh, do more networking? And then he and I have known each other for networking for 20 years. The answer is yes. So we'll do a lot more of that stuff too. So. Make sure you all have a great time. Let you all have your great weekend. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Next week, we will have some really great YouTube videos coming out. I see you've got some questions on CloudFront. Maybe I'll make a CloudFront video. That sounds like a great idea. Probably not on WAF, although maybe I will on WAF because I've yet to use WAF because I always use a marketplace solution for my customers because I need something a little more. But having said that, possibly WAF. But definitely, definitely, definitely we'll do something on CloudFront because I think it's a really good point. SDN, I'll take that under advisement. We can potentially do something on software-defined networking. I think that would be some very, very good ideas. And yes, time to rest. Take care, everyone. Have a nice weekend. I'll see you all very soon.